Good morning and welcome to the regular public meeting of the Henry County Board of Commissioners for 9 a.m. Tuesday, May 1st, 2012. At this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask for an acceptance of the agenda. Motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Mr. Holmes, are you? Okay. Motion carries 5-0. The first item on the agenda is a proclamation for Older Americans Month. Whereas the month of May has been designated as Older Americans Month to recognize the contribution and lives of our senior population and their impact and importance in our community. And whereas this year's theme is Older Americans, never too old to play. Do I hear an amen? From the <laughs> Where older adults have an important role in sharing knowledge, wisdom, and understanding through interactions with children, youth, and adults from other generations. And whereas older adults should be encouraged to actively participate in community activities and stay vibrant by participating in their community and taking advantage of, of services, technologies, and support systems. And whereas creating opportunities for older citizens to participate in interactions and activities with family, friends, and neighbors across generations enriches the lives of everyone involved and helps our seniors maintain their health and independence. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Henry County Board of Commissioners that the month of May be known as Older Americans Month in Henry County, during which time we recognize the important contribution of our seniors and urge every citizen to take time this month to engage with older adults through enjoyable social interactions and activities this first day of May 2012 by the Henry County Board of Commissioners. Now, who is here this morning to receive the proclamation? Susan. Okay, would you like to introduce your group and, and y'all can come up and we'll make this presentation and is there, are there any comments you would like to share while you have an opportunity? Older Americans, you could add a warning out to that list if you want to. I'm on to. it too. Okay. <laughs> I'm thankful to have lived this long. Um, I have Ms. Vivian Hooper who is here in attendance. Everybody knows Miss Vivian, I believe. She's, she's from Salem Baptist Church and she's on their Benevolence Committee and it's just a big supporter of, of our causes, and she, I'd like for her to come up and maybe have a photo op with you all. Um, Miss Ernestine Evans, she is our secretary treasurer uh, for the Council on Aging, and has served for a number of years. And uh, on the day of the walk, you'll see over there, her over there punching numbers and opening envelopes. So come on up, Miss Ernestine. Then we've got Donna Walls. Donna is on the uh, Council on Aging from District 2. Yeah, District 2. And uh, Donna has joined our Council on Aging this past year and has already hit the road running. She's been a big support to us. And, uh, and so they decided they would, be, they would represent the Council on Aging. Uh, Ms. Carolyn Floyd, our chair, was going to be here, but she's had a death in her family, so she was unable to. Uh, we've got Rita Green. Come on up, Rita. Read us a senior, too. <laughs> Rita is actually uh, coordinating our annual Miles for Meals walk. This is the last meeting before our walk this Saturday. And uh, she has a dog and pony show she likes to do if you've got a half a minute to just let her promote it for us. Please do. And then Anne Marie Quincy. Come on up, Anne Marie. Anne Marie is part of our valuable part of our staff. Um, and she is working with Rita in helping with the um, the Miles for Meals walk this year. And we're we're so thankful that you all are recognizing our senior population. Um, we have some who are very high functioning and, and and will be able to play for a long time. We have some that that all of us are helping to maintain a lifestyle at home for as long as they can. Thank you. Rita, would you like to speak to the walk on Saturday? Well, we're all geared up. Our shoes are ready. Our T-shirts are ordered. And I'm going today to pick up the water. And we're ready to walk. We will, uh, the map's been, uh, the trail's been laid out at Heritage Park. And I'm just looking for a lot of walkers to show up and uh, have a good time. We've had a great response from sponsorship from the community. We've got door prizes. We've got a silent auction. 
Sutherland has donated the food, so we're going to have a cookout afterwards. I saw you, Mr. Holmes, look up when I said cookout. <laughs> We've got hot dogs and hamburgers. Um, the Henry players called me right before I walked out the door, and some of them are showing up, and they're going to do some of the songs they sung in Hairspray. Uh, the fire department sending the clowns. We got balloons. It's going to be a great family day. Registration starts at nine. And we will, so they asked me, when is it over? I said, when we get through. So usually it's around 10.30 or 11. It's a family-friendly event, so come out. I, tell, I encourage people not to bring their pets. You can bring your husbands, your, you know, your children and everything if you want to, but leave your pets at home. And um, just come out and support the seniors. All the money is raised at the walk. Stays in Henry County. It goes to help with the Meals on Wheels program, the Insure program, and the home services. We have over 100 on a waiting list now, and I'd like to get those 100 off. My goal, I set a little high, is 50,000 this year, and I really, really hope to make it. But I won't make it unless I get the community to show up and let's walk. Thank you. And is that information, I'm assuming it's on the website? Is it on the front page of the website, Julie? front page of the website um, we put out multiple press releases we assisted with the brochure um, that they put out and all of the other posters and everything and there's also advertising on TV 14 excellent thank you there's a Facebook page and it's in the Times and if you'll notice on uh, the front page of last week's Times uh, Miss Janie McGarity was spotlighted and the McGarity walkers helped design the t-shirt this year so uh, it, I don't know if, if you'll notice Renfro gave us billboard space. It's on the built digital billboards. It's in all the newspapers, and I'm yelling it from the rooftop. Very good. Well, if y'all come up here, we'd like to present your proclamation. All right, moving on in the agenda, we have presentations of Lifetime Master Gardener Awards. If you're not familiar with um, this particular group, Master Gardener is a great program here in Henry County, and uh, it's made up of volunteers, and they contribute many, many hours back to the community and help people keep their yards beautiful and give advice on plants and um, make Henry County just a, a better place to live all the way around. Uh, you probably have heard of the Community Gardens of Henry County. That was started by a master gardener. And uh, I encourage you to find out about this valuable resource here. We have a couple of uh, ladies that we're going to recognize today that have been um, at this for quite some time. The first one I'm going to read, a uh, read some information on and present a certificate to is T.J. Mosley. 
And uh, Frank, did you want to come up after I read through all this and then say something or about the Master Gardener program? I um, need you to come up to the microphone so everybody can hear. I'll let you say it, and then I'll, re I'll read, it, read this about the uh, Master Gardeners we're going to recognize this morning. Uh, the Master Gardener program is part of the University of Georgia Extension Service, and they are volunteers. That you may see them working around the Extension Office. They assist us in sometimes in home visits and, and helping people in the community different projects. There's a long list of projects that they do. They go through a, a training that starts in January, goes through March. They meet one day a week. It's a six county um, <laughs> effort. So, so there's a lot of people from different counties in these classes. Classes are taught by the University of Georgia personnel for the most part. And then once they complete that, they volunteer their services in the community working with the Extension Office. And um, these ladies that uh, today are getting their Lifetime Master Gardener Awards, and they have worked hard. There's a lot of work that goes into what they do. And um, that's, that's pretty much anybody interested in becoming a Master Gardener. They need to check with us around September of, or October. We'll start uh, our our lineup for who's going to be in the classes. The classes are starting in January again. So it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent program. I had an opportunity to go through that some years ago um, when I worked at the Extension Office and uh, the um, entomology class was very interesting. We got to conclude that with uh, chocolate covered grasshoppers. Um, so you get to experience a lot of different things when you go through these programs. T.J. Mosley, let's talk about T.J. for a moment. Nature has been part of T.J. Mosley's life for as long as she could remember. Before retiring from teaching, she realized she wanted to be a volunteer in her community. During this time, a friend who was a Master Gardener Extension volunteer started a garden club at the school where T.J. taught. During the first meeting, she was introduced to a very knowledgeable young Master Gardener Extension volunteer who presented the program on plant identification. The enthusiasm of the Master Gardener Extension volunteers helped her decide this is what she wanted to do as a volunteer. She became a Master Gardener intern in January 2002. In 2004, she served as president of the Henry County Master Gardeners. In 2005, the Natural Resource Conservation Service Department was looking for someone to help with their Arbor Day tree program. She worked very hard to expand their tree giveaway program, which now includes three cities, Locust Grove, McDonough, and Stockbridge. TJ also certified as a master naturalist and completed the certification for the Urban Forestry and Ecology Program. Congratulations to TJ on her 10 years of service to the residents of Henry County and to her for her Lifetime Master Gardener Extension Volunteer Award. And we can give her a hand, and then I'm going to read the next one, and they can both come up together for a photo. <laughs> the next lady we're going to recognize is Susan Patterson. Her interest in gardening began at the age of eight as a campfire girl. Her mother was also instrumental in nurturing this gardening interest as she worked designing a campus garden. As Susan and her husband moved from their various homes, she developed her interest in landscaping design. When she moved to Henry County, she had her first opportunity to, to design her own yard as her home was new. The local paper contained an article by a Henry County Master Gardener Extension volunteer. It spiked her interest. She found out about the program from one of her neighbors. After retiring from 33 years of teaching, she eagerly signed up for the, for the program, and in January 2002, she became a Henry County Master Gardener Extension Volunteer Intern. In 2005, she became president of the Henry County Master Gardener Extension Volunteers. Susan's knowledge has grown by leaps and bounds, and she has found many friends through the program. She said much of her previous knowledge came from people she referred to as plant mamas, who gave her so many precious, precious pass along plants, she learned something new from every gardener she meets. She made lasting friendships and met many individuals that she ne would never have the opportunity to meet if not in the program. 
Congratulations to Susan on her 10 years of service to the residents of Henry County and to her for her Lifetime Master Gardener Extension Volunteer Award. And if you ladies would like to step over here, we want to present your certificates. I don't think teachers ever stop teaching, and that's a good thing. We appreciate you ladies and what you, what you teach us here in Henry County. Okay, we're going to move on to judicial. We have a resolution requesting approval of an agreement with the Georgia Department of Corrections to provide office space for a community impact program. Our presenter is Kelly Bell Castro, Court Financial Administrator, and that's exhibit number two. Good morning. Good morning. Do you have before your resolution to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement, a memorandum of agreement with the Georgia Department of Corrections to lease half of the Aubrey Harvey building to house officers to work alongside our officers to provide a community impact program? Does any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this agreement? If not, you have before you a resolution approving it and I will entertain a motion. Motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The next item is a resolution requesting approval of an agreement for the provisions of guardian ad litem and child advocacy services with Henry Guardian Advocates, LLC, and that's exhibit number three. You have before you a resolution authorizing the chairman to sign the agreement with the Henry Guardian ad Advocates to provide guardian ad litem services for the juvenile court and Superior Court. Does any board member have a question or comment? Mr. Bowman? I only have a comment. These are items that we had extensive discussion on yesterday and uh, got our questions answered yesterday, so it doesn't appear that we're just automatically passing things without having at least had questions and answer period time on it. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. The first Monday uh, prior to the first Tuesday meeting is always a work session, and many of these items we do go over at length in those meetings. If there's no further discussion on this item, you have before you a resolution approving the agreement, and I will entertain a motion. Motion by Mr. Bowman. Second. Second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? The motion carries 5-0. Thank, thank you. Moving on to public safety, we have a resolution requesting approval of a memorandum of agreement with the Georgia Department of Public Safety for the use of county property. Our presenter is Don Ash, Director of Emergency Communications. That's exhibit number four. Don, you've lost weight. I know. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Tamika Kendrick with the Emergency Operations Center. Um, this agreement is a recurring agreement where we provide lease space to the Georgia Department of Public Safety to put fixed radio equipment at our tower site on Old Jackson Road. Does any board member have a question pertaining to this item? If not, you have before you a resolution approving the um, agreement. I'll entertain a motion. Motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? 
Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to social services, we have a resolution requ requesting authorization to submit an application for the fiscal year 2013 Community Services Block Grant Program. Our presenter is Susan Craig, Director of Senior Services, Exhibit Number 5. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, this is our annual allocation for the um, federal funds that we receive through a CSVG grant. Uh, we've earmarked these funds um, for personal support, home delivered meals, and also case management. Uh, this year our allocation is $113,923. This, this was recommended by the Council on Aging, who serves as the advisory board. Okay, and you said the amount is 113 Right. I have submitted a new resolution. Um, okay. Last year, the state included $1,800 for an easy track system, which they're, that was a one-time expense. So they deducted that out this year from our full allocation. Okay. And, Shay, you have the corrected resolution. Are there any questions or comments pertaining to this item? If not, I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve. Motion by Mr. Holmes. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank, Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a resolution requesting authorization to apply for the 2013 Georgia Department of Transportation's Operating and Capital Assistance to Rural Transit Program. Our presenter is David Williamson, Transit Director, Exhibit Number 6. Good morning. Good morning. For the past 22 years, Henry County Transit has been providing public transportation to the county citizens. This is trips for dialysis appointments, doctor's appointments, going to the bank, shopping, meeting uh, critical needs for the people here in Henry County. This uh, 2003 13 application is for $544,127. Local match is $445,897. We request approval, please, to submit the application. Does any board member have a question or comment? I have a question. And David, I, I, you may have the answer. Approximately how many trips do you run each year through Henry Transit? <clears throat> We're on target to about 90,000 this year, anywhere between upwards upper, uh, 700 to 90,000. And that's trips? Yes, sir. And that's not how many people you've served. That's how many trips? How many trips. Okay. Each person represents a, a trip, yes. Okay, so it would be. Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Hey, the ones that the, the, the people that can't afford to pay, they'll pay for this service, correct? We do, do we charge something for? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. It is um, for individuals 16 and above, it's $2 per stop or $4 round trip. 59 and younger, it's uh, $4 a stop or $8 round trip. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, you have before you a resolution approving the uh, application for uh, the applying for the Georgia EOT Section 5311 Transit Operating Assistance, and I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to human services, we have a resolution requesting approval of the health benefits for employees. And that is going to be handout number two. Tara Eberhardt, Human Resources uh, Director, will be making the presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, today you have before you acceptance of the Blue Cross Blue Shield annual renewal for our county's health insurance plan, effective June 1, 2012, <coughs> through May 31st, 2013. Does any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? Mr. Preston? I'm not trying to call it, cause any issues, and I, if, if y'all tell me it's, it's off the table, it's off the table, but I just, you know, one of the big discussion points we had yesterday on where we could potentially find some, some cost savings for the county budget was with the renewal of the health insurance benefits. So are we, if we approve this, are we moving past the ability to make any adjustments to, if we needed that, that additional funds? Is the information provided to Blue Cross and Blue Shield, does that, is that um, include the amount that the employees will be paying or is this approving the overall cost 
Um, this will be approval for the overall cost. This does not um, um, dictate how much the employee or the county will pay for the insurance. This will just be for the approval or acceptance the of, the, of the plans, the three plans that we are offering and the changes that they have um, included in those plans. So when they print all the enrollment materials or the materials that they hand out to the participants, is that not, are they not going to hit the printing press essentially after this gets approved? Um, no, sir. The um, information that Blue Cross will be printing will be on the plan and the plan documents. The information that the county will be providing to the employees will have the rates. So before we proceed with open enrollment, which we have um, pushed back to next week, um, we will need to know the rates as far as the cost share for the employee and the county's um, portion for the insurance. But today's agenda is just for the acceptance of the plans as we have um, before you, and that will allow Blue Cross Blue Shield to proceed with the printing of the plans and the plans that we're adopting, not as um, to address the cost for the employees. One last question, and then we can move on. Is the, the only thing, if we, if we move forward with this, I have no problem with the HMO 8020, the HMO 8515, because I think those are good plans. The POS plans, which we've been losing money on, and this is just, you can see even what the cost is, structure is for the employees is very high, with the family being at $489 a month. I was part of my proposal to yesterday that we had talked about was adding a health savings account option that would offer a very low cost alternative. If we approve this, that basically nulls that out and I just want to make sure that that we're okay with that because that was the plan when I was talking about we could potentially save three million versus two million it was the HSA coming on board for, for that to be possible. Would you like to make a motion to table this item until after the budget discussion? I don't want to table it too much because I know that your department has been working if I very can, hard I can and, add but I, well, I, I but I do if it I would be willing to table it until, until the end of the agenda well, if we could we got to we have got to approve a budget number today we have no choice it has to be done today and so this would have to be we can do this as soon as we give the budget number to the county manager so can we bring this agenda item back to the table at the end of the meeting yes after we abso the meeting? absolutely with that I, I really am not trying to, to call because no, I know your problem. department works very hard on trying to get all this taken care of I just want to make sure we don't paint ourselves into a corner without looking at all options would you like to make that motion? I'll make the motion that we table this to the end of the agenda after the budget. Do we have a second for that? Second. Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? All opposed? All right. Thank you. Do we, do we have an alternate motion? Because the table item failed. Do we have an alternate motion on this, on this item? Well, Terry, basically the repair, I mean, the only changes on this is down. You look at 2012 plan changes, you're basically outlining if somebody wanted to come back and add the, the health savings account at the end, he could still add that, correct? Yes, sir. I, mean, I don't think we're taking it off the table. I think the option could be added, but this right here is not going to affect what we're approving right here. That's correct. correct. You're and basic, I, it's basically a, these four changes, right? Yes. Now, one of the things I did want to add, you may mention about the um, additional plan. The POS plan gives the option for employees that have serious or severe conditions that they do not have a specialist in the area. They may not have a provider uh, within their um, locale where they're located. So this gives the option for those employees who want to pay, as you noted, the additional premium for the POS option. Yes, that is a little bit more, but there are some employees that would like to have that option. So if they would like to go out of network, because this is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia and is located um, for Georgia participants. So for those that go to um, locales outside of the um, Georgia area, that option will be available in, in addition to the normal plans. And one other thing, we also address the $25 spousal surcharge as well as the tobacco, to, uh, tobacco surcharge. Um, and that would be obviously not uh, affiliated with Blue Cross Blue Shield, but it would be an additional surcharge that would go back to the general fund that those employees would pay if they have spouses that work at other employers or if they have the um, tobacco use in their family. But that would be open for discussion during the budget portion yes, of this meeting. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, the last motion to table failed, with, and I needed to, to state this with Commissioner Holder and um, Preston in favor of tabling and Holmes, Stamey, and Bowman opposed. So you have before you a resolution approving the new renewal rates 
and um, if there is an additional um, motion, I'll entertain it. Prior to it, so and and I understand what Commissioner Stamey said. I, I'm pretty sure, but what we're doing is we're establishing this rate and the rates. However, we can we have the ability to come back with a health savings account and the surcharge information, but we need to get this rolling so that Blue Cross Blue Shield can print their information. Mm -hmm. The surcharge has got like I understood it correct. It, it's a surcharge to the employee it goes back into the general fund to help supplement the insurance yes, cost, sir. but it does not go to the insurance company. So by virtue of that, I'd like to make a motion that we approve this portion and that we have time to, I mean, we've got time to talk about the surcharges and the other things. If, if that's correct. That's right? correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. And I'd like to make a motion that we approve this as it's given. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Bowman. Is there a second? Second by uh, Mr. Holmes. All in favor and all opposed. Okay, motion carries with Holmes, Stamey, and Bowman in favor and Holder and Preston opposed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is under planning and zoning services. This is a public hearing. Request to amend Chapter 2, Zoning Districts Table 2.03.03 .03 to amend Chapter 4, Site Design Standards. Section 4.03.21 and Section 4.03.21 and Section 4.03.14. Procedural requirements will be met according to Sections 12.02.11 and 12.03.00 of the Unified Land Development Code. Our presenter is Sherry Hobson Matthews, Director of Planning and Zoning Services, Exhibit Number 7. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board Members. Um, as you all will recall, in April the 2nd, um, staff brought this as a discussion item before the Board um, to look at the conditional uses versus supplemental standards for particular uses within our M1 and M2 zoning district. Um, as a result of dialogue that I received from the commissioners and in review of other jurisdictions, um, staff has prepared a resolution to amend certain sections of the code, um, as Chairman Mathis has previously indicated. Um, staff has determined that there are certainly um, quite a few uses that have supplemental standards and do require conditional use that would be appropriate within our industrial zoning district and staff is recommending that all of those uses that are customarily um, appropriate for an industrial zoning designation should just have to abide by those supplemental standards. Um, in your package you did receive a recommendation from staff to allow record services with storage yards um, to only have to adhere to those supplemental standards with no conditional use being required. Staff would also like to recommend that salvage and junkyards be included under that heading as well and be held to the same supplemental standards as a record service um, because in our opinion they are customarily similar in types of uses. Um, the only difference is the salvage and junkyard would only be permissible within our M2 zoning district and not within our M1 zoning district and that's how it's currently stated in our code of ordinances. Um, then there's also a host of other uses like a daycare facility, lodges and event facilities, amusements, fairgrounds, amphitheaters, rodeos and athletic fields that would still have to apply for a conditional use um, on a case-by-case -case base um, for those uses that want to locate within our M1 and M2 zoning district. I also wanted to um, make you all aware that because we are amending the code of ordinances for this section, um, the supplemental standards can certainly um, be looked at as well. So if there are any um, standards that are currently in place that you all think maybe we need to go back and revisit or maybe that regulation may be too harsh, you certainly can at this meeting amend those standards. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Does any board member have a question or comment pertaining to this item? Okay, if not, this is a public hearing on an ordinance amendment, and I'm going to at this time ask if there's anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in reference to this item. If you could step to the microphone and state your name and address for the record. Good morning. <coughs> Um, I'm Paul Finger with Hurricane Towing. This is my wife, Rita Finger. Good morning. Um, just to ask the other. Um, that's, you want to say something? You sure? Okay. Um, currently, we're relocating our office to um, 
800 Rock Quarry Road in Stockbridge. We well, right now we have been located in McDonough now for what four years? Um, four years. And uh, one of the one of the current standards for a wrecker service includes having a masonry front on your building. Now, this building that we're moving into is a pre-existing building, and uh, the way it was built, half of it is garage area. Well, actually, probably more than half of it is literally garage area with huge bay doors, and then the other side to the left is um, office area. And we are having and try, we're having we have a picture actually. Would that help? Or because that literally shows. Okay. Um, we are having issues with trying to find a masonry product to fit. It's right. It's this picture right here. This is all office area, and it's made of metal. And then the, to the left is. Um, no, the left is office. Yeah, the left is the office area that you know we have no issues. Um, Putting a mason front on. Right, but we are running into um, trouble trying to find a product to that will go up against the metal because obviously we can't take the metal down to put up a, um, a masonry product. So we're, we are wanting some input from you all. Mr. Holder? Just a question. It's certainly not in my area, but uh, I'm familiar with the, the building and the area. And, and the area. Has this not already been used as with records located on this uh, uh, particular lot for the last 20 years or so? We actually did some research and we've determined that the property was used for an office um, facility where the individual did um, store houses, but we have not been able to determine that there was ever a business license issued for a record service. Okay, That's, that wasn't a question though. The house moving company that w was located there had records in the house moving business, and it was they were located on this subject property, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Because it was part of his house moving operation. And and I've we've been made aware that there was a record service that actually moved houses to that location. Um, but we have not been able to determine that it was a storage lot for vehicles. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying it was a storage lot for vehicles. Don't, don't get me wrong. No, 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 no. There were records located on that particular property associated with the house moving business. So my point is the use of the property for the last 20 years has been a house storage lot with records on the premises. And that, that you certainly are true in that statement, but I don't know that they were operating under um, a business license for that type of use. And, and I have not mentioned business license. I just merely mentioned the fact that records were located in that type business has existed on this particular piece of property for more than 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. I agree with you. Okay. Mr. Bowman? The masonry front, it seems, I don't know how the masonry fronts got in there. I know that when the wrecker service <coughs> that was going to move into an office park on at Bellamy Place, there was a, there were conditions that were put on it because other buildings had masonry fronts. I don't know that every single wrecker service needs to have a masonry front. That condition was there because the majority of the buildings and a condition that was put on there by Otis Bellamy back years and years and years ago was that all buildings had masonry fronts. I, I, I'm not sure that maybe that some of that didn't get picked up inadvertently and put in here because I don't know that, I don't think Swanson's has a masonry front. It's an old house and I don't think that I, I'm pretty sure that I, I, I don't know a lot about Elkins. I've been by there a few times. I'm going to speak for the two in the south end. Okay. Neither Elkins nor Corner Lot, who are currently the providers for, for towing in the south end of the county, have masonry fronts on their, their buildings. And, and They're either going to be vinyl or yeah. clapboard or something. It's, yeah. it's not masonry. Either, either. Well, what I'm getting at is I think that in, somehow we've 
inadvertently got to that masonry front issue because we had a park where we were doing a conditional use. Okay, it's going to be a conditional use, and it needs to at least match some of the other buildings within that park. I do not think that it should be a masonry front on every one. I mean, I, 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 and I, Mr. Holder's in his district has those. This is located in my district. It's been car repair business. It's been uh, it's been the house moving business, and they've had I've seen as many as three houses, Commissioner Holder, sitting on that piece of property. So I mean, it's it's, it's perfect for what the applicant, or well, not the applicant, but the person that is speaking now. It's perfect for what they're looking for. It's got fenced in rear. It's got you know, it's kind of got everything that we're looking for. I just don't think that we need to look at the uh, am I wrong, Mike, about the, the conditional use? I mean, because it seems like that that's where we were with that one. Right. And I don't think we need to hang that use on every single one because, you know. It was in, it was in um, to your point, Commissioner, it was in 2010 when those commission, when, those, when that condition was imposed. At the time, it was required that a both the conditional use and supplemental standards were incorporated. Um, at that time, it was in August of 2010, that's when the supplemental standards were were revised to include masonry front, and that's why you know we've spoken about it today about bringing that up. If it is the board's desire to eliminate that as a as a mandated supplemental standard, the board can certainly make that um, adjustment today. And and, and to, to Commissioner Holder's point, he's right. Those those other um, record services were in place far before the 2010 um, ordinance amendment took place, so those would have been allowed to continue to um, to exist as they, as they were. Mr. Harris, I, I beg to differ with you because the corner lot approval was just within the last approximate year okay. by the record committee, and it, it was not in existence prior to that. So they approved that particular location, and it is not a masonry front building. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, I mean, does it have a storage area associated with it or is it just a record service without storage? No, it's record, record and storage. I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. a house for the county. It, 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 Commissioner, I believe it's located in the city, Locust Grove, as opposed to unincorporated Henry County. definitely in the city of Locust okay. Grove. Yes, yeah, so that, that would, it would not have come okay. through from our provisions then. Okay. Can I make a comment? Okay. Sorry. Um, don't mean to interrupt. Um, <clears throat> the last month, we have literally been making this thing up to par. I mean, we've spent a lot of time, money, working on the inside, working our way out. <coughs> so I, I wish, you know, I don't know if people drove by. We're, we're literally concrete in most of the, the front. Uh, we paved, I mean, uh, we've painted the parking lot. We've done the fence already, um, and we're concreting sections as we go I mean, we've already got uh, what a probably a, a 40 by 40 pad port already and we're planning to do the whole thing but we 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 are planning on taking this whole and, and just making it a, a just a lot better place I mean it's going to look good in the end you know it's just that mason front is what we're concerned yeah, about. yeah and it, it just keeps it keeps slowing us up to be honest with yeah. you and um, uh, what else was I going to say about it? Um, but that's one of our, our that's the main that, that's what's really holding us up. And uh, we've we've put new windows in because some of the windows were broken and everything. And I mean we have we've been we we've, we've put a lot of money into this, and we are planning on making this our permanent home, yeah. not just oh we'll stay here for two years. We'll we'll no, go we're, there. We're for, here. This is our so. home. Hopefully. And we do have everything else. Except for the brick. Or except amazing. for the building materials um, as far as the standards go. Mr. Preston, you had a question yeah. coming. I, and I, I'm new to this, but I, I understand why we did the masonry fronts. I mean, because it, it's one of those things where I think in the long term for the community, we're trying to think about the aesthetics of things. But obviously, it doesn't make sense in this situation. Is this not a, because we had the proposal, and this is the public, section of you know going over this change 
Is there no way just this fits into a variance? I mean, because definitely where we just do a variance because this doesn't pass the common sense test and there's a, a solution for, for them? Well, because this is a public hearing, right. Okay. Yes. Within variance and ordinances, there is no common sense factor. So with that being said, um, because this is opened up for a public hearing and because we've advertised it as a text amendment, you all certainly can modify during this meeting any of the standards that are currently listed. So if you all want to do away or eliminate with the masonry front facade, you can do that during this meeting and it becomes effective upon your approval. Um, typically variances are based on development standards, are based on development standards as far as setbacks, um, not meeting the minimum lot size. So in this case, if the applicant um, had met all of the standards with the exception of this, staff would have, had advised them, would have advised them to do, um, proceed with a text amendment. Um, so that would have been the correct process to follow rather than applying for a variance. Wow. So the only solution for them to open this facility without the, the masonry front is to amend it? That is correct. This? It would be an amendment by the board or an amendment by the a request from the applicants. You have to love government. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's going to take you a while. You know? Wow. But anyway, you're, you're, you're right. Common sense leaves the building, I guess. It, it just, you can't, for whatever reason, it's no way to write that into the ordinances. And so, any other board member have a question or comment pertaining to this? All right. Because so the recommendations is for on this by the staff as is that the following use shall be permissible and it shall adhere to supplemental standards with no conditional use required and that would be record services and salvage and junkyards as long as they meet the requirement of the ordinance they will not be required to get a conditional use but in addition to that while we're having this discussion we can also remove the requirement for masonry front yes ma'am that is correct does that take care of everything that we need to address on yes. this issue for now? Yes, ma'am, unless I'm missing something. Michael, does that sound? Well, I, I did want to add to um, <coughs> Commissioner Preston's comment. The only alternative would be to have it as you could do away with the supplemental standards and have it just as a, con as a conditional use. You know, therefore, you'd be seeing every record service with storage yards would come before a board, not necessarily this board, but the zoning advisory board, and they could impose conditions on that particular use on a case-by-case -case basis. That would be the other alternative to address it on a case-by-case -case basis. And in fact, in this case, um, um, Mr. and Mrs. Finger, they are scheduled for a conditional use um, hearing on May 10th. If this condition for conditional use goes away, then that, that, that item will be removed as well. So that would be one way of being able to address it as you've asked. On a, more of on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, what we try to do from a staff standpoint is have supplemental standards that we feel are appropriate for that particular use so we don't have to have so many, <coughs> so much repetition of, um, of meetings for conditional uses. So where we can, we try to have those, you know, we've come to, to, to discover um, but on, on, certain similar, on certain types of uses, it's typically the same types of conditions that are imposed. So in those areas, in those particular uses, well, like we've come up with some sets of supplemental standards that we said these are the, 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 the principal standards that we that we apply. That's what we can do away with the conditional use. But if it's the board's desire to see all of these on a case by case basis, then we can can we can retain the conditional use. And if that's the case, we could do away with the supplemental standards. The the zoning is already there that these uses are permitted um, within. So the zoning is already in place. If it were a rezoning, we would hear the whole thing. But because the zoning is already in place, these uses, if they have the supplemental standards, would keep them from having to come to us every time, which is um, a cost to the, to the citizens or the business owners who are applying. And it is also additional work um, for staff and, and cost associated with the hearings and things like that. And, and it could certainly delay an applicant by at least two months because our zoning advisory board meets every other month. How does it affect the uh, couple of the businesses standing in front of us today? How does it affect them if we if we pass it as it stands? How does it affect this business? Then the only supplemental standard that they would not be able to meet right now would be the building materials. 
Um, as it stands now, my staff is still now. Um, it's my understanding that parking spaces have been identified and all of the remaining supplemental standards have been met. The only outstanding issue is the building materials. So they would have to come before the board for a variance? It would actually be a material? text amendment. I'm sorry? It would be a text amendment and they would have to go to the zoning advisory board first and then to the board of commissioners. So that would be a July meeting before the zoning advisory board and then an August meeting before the board of commissioners. And I mean, there. I thought this was already. We had conversations about this. I thought this was already handled, and this this business was moving forward. I, I would hate to think that we've held them now. And we're going to hold them until August. That's that's. They're scheduled for the May 10th. Right. They are scheduled for May 10th to go before the zoning advisory board for a conditional use, and if the zoning advisory board approves it on May 10th then they're good to go. The only thing we'll verify when they have their business license issued and upon final inspection is that all of the supplemental standards have been met. So they would be ready to go. It would just be back on them to make sure that that front facade has some type of masonry material. Unless we vote to remove that today. Correct. Unless we add that as part of the, remove that from the supplemental standards required for this type of business. If we remove that today, they don't have to meet that. If you all remove it today, they can go to the business license office and obtain their business license because um, they will no longer need the conditional use and they will no longer be bound by the masonry materials. But they will still have to meet all the other standards which they are meeting. But then we've opened it up to where someone else could go into a quote unquote business warehouse type park and would not be held to the same standard of masonry fronts like are on the ones Bellamy or any of the others, it, or have we? Well, that's true, unless, of course, in the <coughs> that we're talking about, if there are covenants already in place within that development, they would still be bound by those covenants. We don't we don't regulate those, but but to your point, yes, you know, others. If there were no covenants in place, underlying covenants in place to that mandated that yet had to have a brick front or brick facade. But if they come on May the. Tenth. I'm, I'm just trying to understand it because I'm, I'm a little confused. If, if they come on May 10th and ask for a variance on the masonry materials and the Zoning Advisory Board allows it, they're good to go. Well, they have not applied for a variance. The only thing they've applied for is a conditional use to allow a record service in the M2 Zoning District. So as it stands, the Zoning Advisory Board could recommend approval of the conditional use with the understanding you still have to meet all of the supplemental standards. So once they're approved on May 10th, it's up to them to make sure they meet all of the standards before we will release any licenses to the applicants. Now if they can't um, provide or put the masonry materials on the building, then that takes them into a whole other hearing process, which would be the text amendment. Is there any way that the language could somehow read that um, in not every building is suitable for masonry fronts? It's almost impossible or cost prohibited that we could give some flexibility to the zoning advisory board to make that determination as to whether or not that facade is suitable for a masonry front. What we've done in the past, uh, more particularly for industrial buildings and for commercial buildings, on past zoning conditions that I've seen, um, staff has been given the flexibility to look at the surrounding properties and determine if what they're proposing is comparable to what's in the area. And that way we're able to keep it customary to what's surrounding and what the adjacent properties are. Um, my only fear with that is that if we eliminate the conditional use, then the record services won't be going to the Zoning Advisory Board. So if we put it back on the Zoning Advisory Board to determine the materials, they'll still have to wait every other month to just get an architectural elevation plan approved. And we can't, um, we can't give that responsibility to the staff just Absolutely. as we do with landscape plans? Yes, ma'am, you sure can. We can't? Yes, ma'am. Then that may be the better way to to handle a situation like that. The main thing, I want to see this business up and operating. They have gone way too long, and I had assumed that they were okay. I'd made a couple of calls, and I'd gotten some calls from you, but I'd been getting the same calls from uh, from Mr. Kennard, and, and I felt like I was answering like five calls a day from John Kennard, and, and it was like, oh my gosh, 
and I, I thought we were okay. I ne and I, I drive up and down that area all the time, and I see you working on it. And I just don't think it's fair for government to keep these people from I mean, it just don't make any sense on this issue. I'd like to see them open. I don't know what we got to do to get them open, but I'd like to see them open. If the board approves the request to eliminate the conditional use and to modify the building materials to leave it as to be determined by staff based on what the character of the area is, once you all stamp it approved, they're ready to go. I make a motion that we go exactly what you just said. We give the staff the ability to look at the surrounding area because if you look on Rock Point Road, that's <laughs> okay. We're good to go. So uh, that way, I, I make the motion that we follow that. Are you are you good with that, uh, Madam Clerk? I, I, Do you know what we just said? Okay. Well, I make the motion that we follow the guidelines and that we make that motion. And it's public comment. Oh, we're that's right. On. We hadn't called for opposition. Is there any, uh, before we move forward with asking for a second, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak in reference to this particular amendment? Okay. So we have a motion on the floor by Mr. Bowman. We have a second by Mr. Holder. Is there any further discussion on this item? Ms. County Attorney, before I call for a vote, do you have any? Any comment you wish to make before I call, before I call for a vote? Um, I think uh, in discussing it with um, Ms. Matthews, I was concerned about the vagueness of the language that staff is just going to determine the standard to be applied to these buildings. But I think we resolved that the um, language would read that staff would review surrounding areas, um, age of the building, and you know, just to sort of give staff some direction, so it just won't be open-ended. That they have no parameters under which to make those determinations. So she's going to craft the language to incorporate those standards. All right. If there's no further discussion on this item, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Okay. Motion carries five zero. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Taylor's Landing at Spivey Homeowners Association of Stockbridge, Georgia. They request a modification to a zoning condition for property located on the east side of Spivey Road, north of Stone Mill Drive, in Landlot 42 of the 12th District. The request is to modify a zoning condition regarding a 20-foot undisturbed buffer. Our presenter, <coughs> Sherry Hobson Matthews, Director of Planning and Zoning, and Butch Oliver, Director of Stormwater, and that's handout number one. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Madam Chair, I'm going to turn this over to Butch um, to get into the stormwater issues, but I just wanted to remind you all while we're back here today. Um, two weeks ago, there was a request by the Taylor's Landing HOA um, requesting to eliminate a 20-foot undisturbed buffer that was placed on the property during the rezoning. Um, during that time, there were... Um, property owners who came up and expressed some concern regarding the water quality critical buffer and staff was charged with going back trying to determine the purpose of the buffer and what the end results would be if we were to remove that buffer. So I'm going to turn it over to Butch to kind of give some more history and to kind of bring you all up to speed on what we've determined um, regarding that request and then I'll be able to answer any questions or Butch. Yeah. No, the final plan. Oh, yeah. While she's looking for the final plan. Uh, like Terry said, staff had a, we had a meeting about it uh, with our engineer and with the engineer of design, Mr. Whitley. Um, the subdivision was designed with a water critical area in mind along with the detention pond. Okay. The first option that we talked about we don't think is can do because it would increase the size of if you took away the critical area, the water critical area, it would increase the size of the detention pond. Well, there's houses on both sides of it and it's not enough room to, to make the, the pond bigger. Plus the cost would probably be too much for the subdivision. So the other two options we come up with was <coughs> um, there should be a water critical area buffer around the perimeter of the subdivision as described on the final plat dated 9-10-08. Should an individual property owner wish to modify the buffer, it must be approved by the Henry County Environmental Compliance and Plan Review and Stormwater Departments. 
prior to any modifications to the existing buffer, all modifications to the buffer must include a revised hydro study and detailed landscape plan along with a privacy fence. Now that's for individual lots. The second option is for there shall be a water critical buffer area around the perimeter of the subdivision as described on the final plat dated 91008. The homeowners association shall submit to the stormwater department a revised hydro study and detailed landscape plans preferred by a certified prepared by a certified engineer. Now that would if you go with the individual lots, that means that each person that wants to do away with that water critical area would have to hire a certified professional engineer to do us a landscape plan, uh, which would it, they could take the, tre the existing trees down and then come in with a landscape plan so they could utilize their property in the back, put up a privacy fence, with, which that landscape plan could be anything from uh, shrubbery to, to sod to anything like that that comes up. Uh, with a landscape plan so that then we would review it to get a permit and then they could install that once it's approved by staff so that it does not increase the runoff to the detention pond because the pond is pretty much it's fixed. Yes sir. Are you speaking of the uh, 20 foot level? The whole 50 feet. Parts of it is 50, parts of it is 40 I believe. Is that right Sherry? That is correct. Okay. And, and I don't know if Butch wants to speak on this, but when the original 20-foot buffer um, was placed on the rezoning, at that time the site had not been developed. So at that time we didn't know what size detention pond was going to be needed. So once it got into the development stage, it was determined that in order to reduce the size of that pond, they could install a 50-foot buffer. So the 20-foot buffer was, was used to make, create the 50-foot buffer. So there was a 30 plus the 20, which made the 50. And they did that in order to maximize the number of lots on that property. So they didn't want to increase the size of the detention pond for that very reason. It's my understanding that that was the intent to be able to get the maximized. Yeah. There was, there was, we have what we call the North Georgia uh, Blue, Bit, Blue Book, which is kind of what we go by. There was two options in there that, that the engineer of record designed this subdivision to. It was, it was a design credit number four that's in the Blue Book. And it was a design credit number one. They combined both of those. That was number one. That's straight out of the blue book. And then you have a number four. So he used the combination of these two credits in order to, so he could get the design and the lots yield that, that they wanted in it. So um, we've come up with the two options. I think they're good options. Um, but it does require a professional engineer to design the landscape plan and be approved by staff. Were you able to go out and inspect? I mean, we had several residents here who were being impacted from runoff on their property that was adjacent to this particular track. Were you able to determine what the causation of that was? No, ma'am. I personally didn't get to. There was some staff that did go out there. We talked to that staff. Um, the uh, the way, that, the, the way that it was designed, that a lot of this water that was originally going off of the property has now been diverted. It goes into these storm drains that goes down to the detention pond. So the water that was going off this away is, is some of it has been diverted over into the storm drains. It goes into the detention pond. So they're not getting as much water as they used to get. And Commissioner Preston, I apologize. I didn't tell you that staff's recommendation has now changed right. in light of the additional information. And, and that was my only question was is that I, I remember the homeowners showing up and they were very well organized. They had pretty much gotten, I think, everybody but one signature, two signatures in the entire neighborhood. So, and that, it was put up before us originally with a recommendation by staff that we were going to approve this and then through our discussion as a board it come to find out, wait a minute, we might have some water quality issues here. So is there any way to, to kind of rectify, since I felt like we led the homeowners astray, that there can be a refund of, of their application fee? Because I remember seeing in their language how they had organized that to gather that fee. And I feel like this is one more case where we didn't exactly do them right by the fact that we kind of, I think, I think we gave them indication that we were going to do this mm -hmm. before they put together their formal application from their communication with the staff. That certainly would have to be, I mean, that's a decision by the board and certainly if you all direct me to do such, we can certainly 
do that. Mr. Let me ask you a question. Um, who, who was the original developer on this and who was the builder? Mm. Um, Commissioner Stamey, I remember the applicants and it was Charlie and Clifford Scandrick. Um, Mark Whitley is the engineer of record, um, but as far as the builder and the developer, I'm not sure, but I can certainly try to get that answered for I you. I would just like to know that. But, excuse me, if somebody back there in the back would know. Jefferson's, Jefferson's home. Jefferson's home, and Jefferson's that was the only builder. That just who, who was the developer? Who? Brown, Georgia. Crown Communities, okay. Thank you. Don't know either, so it's fine. Um, and Commissioner Preston, one thing that we wanted to do as staff, and we certainly agreed that when the request originally came in, we were under the understanding that this water quality critical buffer may not have, it may have just been placed on the actual final plat. Um, so what we tried to do internally was work to satisfy all parties, the citizens who came out and had concerns and the property owners, and that's why staff is looking to not eliminate the buffer, but to modify the request to read based on either the option one or option two that Butch uh, mentioned. And, and, I, and I understand that, and I think that's fine, but I mean, realistically, in reality, most people aren't going to be able to go through some of those logistical things that they have to do to, to get that done. Because you know, we're asking for an engineering plan and all these things that kind of, on a per individual basis, that kind of knocks them the reasonableness out of it. So I'm just, I just, when I see a mistake is made, I think you own up to it and you just, and, and there was a little bit of a mistake in the fact that we led the, these citizens to believe that they were going to get this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm yes. not sure we, I'm not sure I understand how well, we made a mistake. I made anybody believe that we were going to approve this. We didn't make a mistake. What yet. was the recommendation last, two weeks ago? The, the staff made the recommendation that this was going to get approved because that we didn't understand that this was a water critical. Well, staff can, never, staff can never tell an applicant your request is going to be approved. Staff can say you can file the paperwork and you can go through the right. process, but they cannot give final approval, and they know that on certain items, and especially removing a zoning condition. So to get to the, where we're at today, I don't believe we've made a mistake. It's okay. the process that we have in place to find a resolution that will work for the citizens, if at all possible, because I left here at the last meeting thinking, I'm not sure we can do anything sure. for well, them, that now at least they've been able to review this and find that there is a way that we can and help them. It's just going to take a few extra steps. And it's certainly through no fault of the county because we have EPD regulations. That blue book, you have to follow it because if you don't, we'll end up getting fined as a county for that. We have, it is a, a, a water quality, stormwater control is a federal mandate. It is not optional for, for government. So I don't feel like we've made a mistake in this case. May, may I add something? The, uh, when staff went out there and looked at it, uh, the report back to us was that what is out there and there are, are some pine trees, some privet hedge, and things like that, which really doesn't clarify the water as well as sod or grass or something like that would. There's, there's still going to be some runoff of uh, sediment that is out there now that is going into the pond. So if, if, they go, if you go this route or they go this route, you're actually your water critical as far as filtering the water through the sod would be better. It would increase the runoff a little bit, but as long as we got it by an engineer, then we're in good, good shape. Madam Chair, the, the comment I was going to make is this is sort of like the mailbox thing in a way. People buy these lots and they see a 30 foot water quality and they see a 20 foot buffer and they really don't understand what that means. And, you know, it, it's, it's difficult for the board to come back and tell these people that there's a restriction of their property there, but the properties are the way that you that you find them, that you you know that they're sold that way. So it's is something that the builder developer put on the lot a restriction on that lot that's there, and I don't know how you would communicate to people when they buy these to make sure what all that means. It's you know, it's just another thing that the buyer needs to investigate and understand what it means. In this case, I think the county is being very uh, 
workable and actually using some common sense, if you will, to allow these people not to say undisturbed means undisturbed. We're saying what makes common sense to me is if you can put landscaping or materials out there that actually do a better job of the water quality aspects of filtering that water, we certainly want to allow you to do that. Uh, so I think the staff in this case has done an excellent in trying to make a situation um, that they probably were unaware of, maybe turn that into something that will work out for the county's benefit and theirs. Mr. Phillips. Yes, sir. Uh, when we use the terms engineered drawings and getting the engineer to come, you know, I mean, what what type of money are we talking about that a homeowner would have to come up with? I mean, you know, I know you're not going to know the down, the exact number, but you, you've been dealing with this for a long time. So I'm going to say ballpark, and I know there's an engineer sitting behind me back here, Mr. Elliott, and he might could help me out on this. But uh, I would say ballpark individually, you're probably looking at somewhere maybe between $1,500, $2,000. For a lot? Yeah. For one month. And if you do the whole subdivision, which will probably be easier uh, for the whole subdivision to participate in, I'm going to say somewhere around five to eight, maybe. Wow. Okay. I, that, uh, Am I close? That would probably turn around a lot of people from one <laughs> to two. <laughs> <She> <laughs> don't say that. That's so. my point. I mean, I, I wasn't trying to pick on the staff. It's just that. I, when you see homeowners that it's t exactly what Terry said is that they see this as their land and I know there was already requirements on the books and they were there for a reason it's just they probably weren't conveyed as well as maybe they could have been when the, the assets were sold the houses were sold to them and I just hate to see citizens who have already taken time out of their day to come over here to, to, to present this they've organized <coughs> they've organized 15 people to, to do the same thing we all know we can't it's hard to get five of us to, to do something so that's the only thing i was saying is I, I wanted to recognize that they did a good job i was trying to make them whole in the situation i'm not trying to to, to cause ripples or, or problems i just recognize the homeowners have done a good job all right the um the last meeting that we had actually was the public hearing and we tabled our decision until this meeting until we got further information so we've already had the public portion, uh, the public hearing portion of the request. So with that being said, um, you have before you a resolution with the proposed um, recommendations of staff on how best to deal with this uh, particular issue. And if um, there's no further questions or discussions from the board, I will look to Mr. Preston for a motion. Well, at this point, I think um, since we are trying to add some flexibility, I go with the recommendation. I want to make a motion to, to go with the recommendation of the staff to, with the engineering plans and the other things to be able to modify this if, if you do the go through the, what the staff has recommended. All right. Well, we have a motion to approve the resolution as, um, as stated by staff. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries 4-0 with Bowman, Holder, Preston, and Holmes in favor and staying in opposition. You're in opposition? Okay. All right, 3-2. I'm sorry, your hand sort of went up before, I, <laughs> before the rest of them went down. So I just thought you were slow there. So with Stamey and Bowman in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is a request to amend certain sections of the alcohol ordinance. Our presenter is Michael Harris, Planning and Zoning, Zoning Services Division Director, and that's, a, that's going to be handout number three. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Board members. Um, some few years back, we went back and made some amendments to our alcohol ordinance, and from time to time, as we become made aware of certain provisions within an ordinance, if it's antiquated, we'll go back through and bring that amendment back before the board, and that's what we have, have in this case. There was a provision that was included in our existing, our current ordinance that prohibits elected officials from being able to um, hold the retail license, and that's for any state, local, municipal, or county level. And 
the amendment today is, certainly, it is simply to come through and um, amend the ordinance by deleting that portion of the of our current ordinance to allow whether from someone from out, out not just within Henry County but outside within the state of Georgia on a state level any kind of a local local elected official on a state local or federal level or county level rather from being able to hold a a retail license don't know why it was in place um, in speaking with the county clerk she's done some research on it and it looks like it dates back uh, about four or five decades yeah 60s 60, 60 and 70 so just felt it was an antiquated um, provision of the current ordinance so we felt it was necessary to bring it out for history <laughs> 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 I can tell, tell you why I was put in there, but I'm not. I we wish you would because we, we figured there was a back story. I'm sorry? We figured there was a story behind There's it. There's a story behind There's definitely a story behind it. This, this item actually came to light because Henry County is hopefully soon to be home to a Cheddar's restaurant on Jonesboro Road. That's right. And the gentleman who owns these franchises and builds these restaurants is an elected official in Macon. That's correct. But no because he's an elected official, he can't hold an alcohol license in Henry County to open a restaurant. That's correct. And that's how this issue came up. And that's when we tried to do a little research on the ordinance and found out it went back into the 60s. And you couldn't even, you couldn't buy alcohol in the 60s in Henry County, could you? So that that's kind of that's kind of how this all came about. It's very interesting, and it's funny because when you start going back and looking at some of these older ordinances, you know there's an ulterior motive behind some of the provisions that are put into them, but only Mr. Holder knows what they are, and he's not talking. I, I am aware of this one. <laughs> Does any board member have a question or comment for um, Mr. Bowman? A question. I, I went over and just kind of read the. No retail alcoholic beverage license shall be issued. I read down through there about green cards and, and about, uh, you know, all types of things. But number four, no license shall be issued to any person who is not a natural person. Well, I just think about what a natural person is. Excellent question. Um, and Ms. Dottie Green, our business license supervisor, is also here. Um, if she can be help me out, and I, I, that's another one that may we may, may need to look at in subsequent time. I'm or just like curious to, what a natural today. person was. I know I most know. of us probably aren't, but anyway, what I'm not sure how that's. Person. I'm not sure specifically how that's citizen, defined. A natural a naturalized citizen. Naturalized we probably citizen. need to clarify that because that. Yeah. That's the that's the only one I have. I just I, when I read them, I thought, wow, you know, what is a natural person? But that's number four on your list. So. That just means non-incorporation has to be a live human being, not a corporation, which is also an artificial person under the law. So a natural person means an actual human being. Well, thanks can for we that can we put a parenthesis in there that defines what that means? Because it does sound it's kind of stupid just, just sitting there without, without an explanation. Lawyer, lawyers know, really but we could put in. I mean, I guess we could put something Maybe in there. Maybe ninety eight point six in breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments, Michael? If not, you have, uh, well, this is an ordinance amendment. Do we have to call for public comment? No? Okay. You have before you um, a resolution to amend this section of 3-14-50, and um, I will entertain a motion. Moved to approve by Mr. Holmes, second by Mr. Preston. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Okay, Ms. County Attorney, we're going to discuss a resolution concerning the personal care home moratorium exemption request for property located at 2475 Jonesboro Road, and that is exhibit number eight. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Um, last month, you all imposed a moratorium on the uh, processing and issuance of business licenses for personal care homes. And that moratorium came about as a result of some confusion that existed with respect to terminology in the Unified Land Development Code 
um, we went back and reviewed the video of the public meeting when that code was amended concerning personal care homes. There were some discrepancies there. And also through research, we discovered that um, during last year, 2011, a number of jurisdictions throughout the state had imposed moratoriums on personal care homes because they had there have, have been a, an eruption of these personal care home facilities throughout um, the state, and with that came a lot of problems. And so a number of jurisdictions had to revamp their ordinances and take another look at um, whether or not they want to impose stricter requirements on, on their ordinances governing these uses. And so the board, taking all that into consideration, imposed a 90-day moratorium. Within that moratorium resolution was a process for an exemption request for any uh, applications that were, had been received but yet not yet processed. And the current resolution and matter before you today um, is the application of Hyacinth Do Doily, who resides in Locust Grove but wants to operate a personal care home at 2475 Jonesboro Road, Hampton, Georgia. She filed her application in February prior to the imposition of the moratorium. And in your packet, I put together for you a timeline of some relevant facts that I thought were, would be helpful and to aid you in your review of this request today. Um, the moratorium resolution, I will say, had a 30-day time frame in this particular uh, request from Ms. Doyle came in um, the end of March, March 27, so it's right for your review. <clears throat> and I want to make, make it clear that should you grant the request, it doesn't mean that she can get her license, it just means that she still will follow the process that existed prior to the moratorium and it will be processed in that manner. Should you deny the request, then you would be she would have to wait until the moratorium expires and be subject to the new rules that are forthcoming. And Ms. Matthews is planning on bringing that, the new rules to you on May 15th. Uh, she's going to bring it well before the 90 day time period has expired. <coughs> so with that said, um, you see that Ms. in the relevant facts summary that I prepared for you, that Ms. Doyle applied for a business license in February 22nd. Um, she had actually, though, been operating a personal care home um, without a license prior to that time. And um, our business license supervisor got wind of that in the state official, but from the state, and um, the state advised Ms. Doyle that she needed to go through this process. Um, Ms. Doyle has told me, and she is here today, you can hear from her, that she has now gone through the state licensing process and um, has completed all the requirements there and the last step in the process is the issuance of the business license. She has a three-year lease um, that she entered into in December of 2011 for the subject property, and the property um, is outside of a subdivision, although and Ms. Matthews, the Planning and Zoning Director, clarified that because there was some error on the zoning map, but the property is not located within a subdivision, and it's RA zone property. So unless the board has any questions of me, um, I'll ask Ms. Dwelling to come up and let you hear directly from her. I, I, just, I have one quick question. I guess that really doesn't have a lot to do with the discussion today, but I'm curious as to how long this business was operating without a license in our county. I'm not certain, but Ms. Dwelling is here. Uh, that would be a good question I'd <laughs> like to have answered. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Hyacinth Doily, and my request is for um, resolution of um, a personal care home monitor. How, how long did you operate your personal care home without a license? I have not been operating without a license. Okay, Your according to what we're reading here, the state came down and, and said that you were operating without an appropriate license. No, I'm not operating without a license. I set up the home and apply for the business license. So the house is already set up and approved by the fire department only to get the business license now, but it's not operational. Dottie, would you like to add something? 
Um, did you go out? I mean, you're the one that brought this to the attention of the state. Um, right. The state contacted us and said that they had been out to visit the, um, the location where she was on um, Jonesboro Road and that there were three, um, I think I said from the report that's in there, the job a copy of, that there were three individuals there. Um, and so that's how it came to our attention because they had called, they called my department. Do you know how long it had been operational before the state came, uh, notified you? I don't know how long you had known. Um, no, she had moved in there because she had moved, um, she had had an operation on Conkle Road. Yes. And that you moved the location from Conkle we Road were, to Jonesboro Road. We were Road. moving to this new location. And you I, had a license on Conkle Road? Yes, ma'am. But you didn't have two separate facilities. You just had one facility one that you were moving from one location to the other. Yes, ma'am. Do you, board member, have a question for Ms. Dooley? Our question for Latanya. Okay. I have a question. Tanya, you, you say that you remember that it was there a license issued from the state as well as the county on Conkle Road? Yes. Okay. And you just simply moved this existing facilities, closed the other one, and moved to this facility, correct? Yes, sir. I saw the other inspections where the fire department's been out there and the state's been out there. I guess we've been and out the there. the building department. Okay. Yes, sir. Was, is not part of Thornberry subdivision. It is an out parcel which complies and meets the requirements for the uh, the home, correct? Yes, yes it does. And I think a large part of the um, concerns from the previous, um, that prompted the moratorium to be issued dealt with homes within subdivisions. I think that was a large part of the concerns that um, were discussed originally when this ULDC provision was added and that was the subject of the amendments perhaps in the moratorium. So this one is outside of a subdivision so it would not be subject to that. I'm not really privy to what new provisions the planning and zoning director is going to bring to you all on, in a couple of weeks but um, as it pertains to the existing ordinance this would be outside of a subdivision. And it's zoned RA currently? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions or comments pertaining to this item? I'd just like to echo one of the thought Mr. Holder had just said about the, this is not part of a subdivision. It was never broken off, correct? It is not part of a subdivision, and that is part of the record in the packet um, that Ms. Matthews has provided written confirmation of that fact. Right. Well, I guess she did have a license at the previous location. This is the first I'm hearing of that, but Ms. Yes. Green yes, has I confirmed did. that. Okay. So, and the state certainly, the state, she's gone through the process for, the state process for the Jonesboro Road location. And our ordinance says that we won't issue a business license until you get state approval. And I think the state's saying, well, we won't issue the state license until the county says it's okay. So it's more like a, it's just a waiting game at this point. So in the midst of her transition, she kind of got caught between the, the uh, moratorium. Is that where she is right now? We can't issue a business license because of more moratorium. Yes, sorry, it's that, sorry, that, that way. Okay. Yes. Well, when the state issues a license, it is for a particular location, such as it could be a beer and wine license or a used car license or whatever, but that license is assigned to a particular location, and it's not one that you can take from one location to another without getting approval from the state for a relocation. So. And I'll add that's to that probably what triggered. And I'll add to that, Commissioner Holder. You know, our fire department has to go out as well, so you can't just transfer those to exactly. you know, new locations. Yes, it, it, it is assigned to a particular location. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, you have before you a resolution uh, for a moratorium exemption request, and I will entertain a motion on that. Motion to approve by Mr. Holmes. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Preston. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. And please note that uh, Commissioner Bowman is not in the room for the vote. The next item on the agenda is a resolution requesting approval of a professional agreement with Croy Engineering pertaining to capital improvements at Atlanta South Regional Airport. Our presenter is Fred Alletta, County Manager, Exhibit Number Nine. According to Madam Chair and Good Commissioners, um, 
Item number uh, nine is to request a approval of an agreement with Croy Eng uh, Engineering. This uh, agreement is to strike the airport. When we took the airport, um, the striping is just about gone. Uh, FAA uh, GDOT did an inspection of it and strongly desire that we get this done right away. This is for the engineering. The cost to do the engineering alone is the figure as presented of $18,000, uh, 18770 um, Croy Engineering was approved back on December 5th as one of our two experienced and qualified airport engineers. Um, at the time, back in December, when this was approved, the prior county manager had uh, sent an RFQ, which nine firms responded. Uh, he narrowed it down to four, then LPA and Croy were the two remaining uh, consultants that were selected and submitted to FAA and GDOT for approval. Uh, so that as we go forward, these two firms are already approved by FAA and GDOT to do the types of works that we need to uh, take care of the, uh, any improvements at the airport. Air, uh, LPA was chosen as a, the lead, and Croy is, uh, in essence, somewhat of a backup. And Cor is this eligible for the 90% reimbursement from the FAA? Yes, it is. And, and uh, the, in this particular case, the 18770, we are eligible for 90%. 90%. Um, in the next uh, presentation I'll make, um, I'll discuss that as well, but this one will be eligible immediately for the 10% reimbursement. Once they start this and complete this work, they'll put the work out for bid to do the actual uh, striping. Um, I've had estimates anywhere from twenty dollars to $60,000, even at one time 80000 So the number's all over the place, but it'll be put out for bid once the design is done according to this $18,770 uh, design work that's been approved. Um, also want to, uh, in this one as well as the next one with uh, LPA and the next three, uh, when the uh, scope of work and hours are submitted to GDOT, GDOT goes ahead and reviews it and has dialogue back and forth with either of these vendors. Uh, in this particular case, there was numerous uh, emails back and forth in a period of about two weeks in which GDOT said, you don't need to do this or you do need to do this or these hours are too high. So GDOT, upon our selection of these two consulting firms, then becomes the one that starts reviewing for reasonableness and appropriateness of scope, hours, and rates. And then once that's done, then um, it's approved and come to before you to go ahead and approve that uh, contract. Mr. Bowman. A lot of this has to do, Fred, with, uh, with our being able to widen the airport, lengthen the airport. A lot of this is part of that. Isn't that part of the design or is this just the this, striping? This is just the striping. The issue becomes one of doing the striping uh, before we do the widening. Uh, the issue remains on the widening, and I'll cover that in the next part. Uh, the issue on the widening comes down to whether, in fact, uh, we will have to resurface the existing runway. Um, at the present time, we've, we've narrowed the um, extension uh, to 1,000 feet, which will keep it within the boundaries of the property owned by the county and give us enough footage up to the fence to be able to do that. Um, when that 1,000 feet uh, is extended, the question becomes one whether the runway, because of the additional weights that are going to be able to be landing there, aircraft to be able to land, whether the runway, existing runway has to be um, added approximately two inches more of paving. So in one sense, one can argue that doing the paving and then within the next year having to resurface and add a, another layer you're wasting your money. This is a requirement of FAA right now to get done for safety reasons, uh, and they want this done. We have at the present time about $66,000 in available funds in our entitlement funds at the uh, GDOT. Uh, the cost of this and the cost to do the actual re repairs, provided they don't go over $50,000, let's say, will be covered by those funds at the 90% and our 10% contribution. 
Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I think uh, so. Basically, cost to the county is eighteen hundred twenty-two dollars. Correct. Eighteen hundred. So, yeah, just I mean, you know, and, and I understand we're going to be looking at that. I'll, I'll reserve my other comments for the next section, but uh, thank you. Mr. President. Fred, I, I want to ask, you know, I understand this because this is not going to cost the county a, a, but $1,800 to do the engineering on it for the striping. But are we, is there, you mentioned that there's a pot of money with the, that's available to help us proceed with this. And I'm just, if we're going to have to potentially do this twice, is there, is that, does it hurt us, you know, on using that money? Do you see what I'm saying? Does that pot get reduced because we are using a portion of this for the striping? The money to do the, to do the uh, construction of the airport the extra thousand feet, the restriping or striping would be included in that bid as well. So, to the extent of taking away funds that we can use down the road, right. the grant that would be requested for the extension would include the striping of it as well, if necessary. In so, it still be eligible for ninety percent. It'll be eligible as well. Okay. And, and as I said, in a sense, it, to your point, everybody's point, my, and mine included, it, it almost seems not silly, but it seems. Why do it if, in fact, and the issue is safety? It's been that way. They did bring FAA out to look at it and basically said it's got to get done. And again, GDOT, who has the money, says get it done, put your 10 percent in, and get it taken care of. Well, the last thing we need is an incident out there involving a crash of an aircraft because the, there wasn't proper striping on that um, runway. So when yeah, when they when they say it's a safety issue and they want it done, that's typically not a suggestion. It's typically they want it done. Well, and to that point of the monies we have um, in the next uh, submission here, resolution, the question became one of do we put the money we presently have against this or against that? They, FG dot basically said, no, you're going to put it against this and get this done. So they control the money in that sense. So that's where the resolution you have before you is to take care of it in the order in which they want. This may be a silly question because, um, and I know there's probably people out in the audience that can answer it if we can't, is that I know when you repave a road or, or the, you know, you're doing things, sometimes they have temporary striping that they can put in that's much, you know, it's not as, is that not a possibility? I'm, I'm just asking. I'm not, I'm not kind of trying to cause, but you know how you see that. Maybe it's not safety-wise or maybe there's requirements that don't allow well, it. But Let me cover that and, and, and maybe even go back a step on it because of, I've had dialogue with the engineers and GDOT on this. Um, to me, and I think to most people, you go out and we do road striping right now. So one says, why do you need design work for $18,770 to go put striping on top of existing striping? And the short answer is because that's what the way the FAA and GDOT wants it done. And that's the only answer I can give you because that's the answer I've been given. It's their requirements that you will have a design work before you do the striping. And this is the cost and requirement to do it. So, you know, I can't answer your question other than tell you it is a process. I've talked to engineers. I've talked to GDOT. And they have said you have to have a design before you put it out. It looks pretty obvious that whatever striping you can see or was there, you would just raise stripe over it. It isn't that easy. I'm learning as, as I right. go through this process. Mr. Holm. I was going to ask if this was a requirement uh, from the FAA to answer it being put forth as that as they did the inspection a couple weeks ago and thus at that point we put it out to Croy to go ahead and put the uh, bid together hours hours in scope not bid but hours in scope together to be approved by GDOT and this is the end result. I figured you would ask that same question because I know you pinched the pennies too. Even went so far as to say why can't we have our own uh, department do it here. <laughs> and, and, and Terry and I have talked about what would it take for having him do it. There are some material differences that uh, gets into it. And, and Terry and I have talked and there's some equipment that we would need to, to obtain that may make the cost of doing it more prohibitive for us to do it to buy the equipment to get it done. So once we get all the bids in after the design work's done, we'll take a look at uh, whether we can do it, if we can buy the equipment and end up being cheaper and have the equipment for future, um, or going to the outside with the bids that come in, if they're cheaper than us doing it ourselves, the same thing. Okay. But first step first is we got to get the design work done for $18,770. 
Any other questions or comments? If not, you have before your resolution approving a professional agreement with Croy Engineering in the amount of $18,770, with that cost being eligible for 90% reimbursement by GDOT, and I will entertain a motion. Motion by Mr. Bowman to approve, second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. And the next item is the resolution requesting approval of the professional agreement with the LPA group pertaining to capital improvements at ASR, and that's exhibit number 10. Again, uh, back in uh, December, um, commission approved, again, both LPA and uh, CROI to do the plan design consulting of all capital improvements to the airport. In order to proceed with any improvements, extension of the runway, the three items that I'm presenting here are requirements as well. Um, starting with uh, the smallest one, which is the, the DBE program, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. Um, the plans are required by FAA in order to maintain FAA funding eligibility for projects listed in the Airport Capital Improvement Program. In other words, if you don't do this, you can't apply for uh, capital funding or funding in your capital improvement program. So uh, it is a requirement, again, of FAA. And the cost on that is the um, $11,306. Uh, the next one is the EA, uh, Environmental Assessment. Um, this is a study that has to be done. It's, it's updating an existing study. But this is to document the potential impacts associated with the pro proposed improvements to the Atlanta Regional Airport. Uh, this will take about six months to complete. We can't do anything out there until this study is done and approved by GDOT and FAA. If it, and then um, from there forward, we can proceed with the construction um, of the uh, airport, but not before this uh, environmental assessment is, is done. Uh, the third one is the uh, ALP, or the airport layout plan. Uh, this one's for 113,910. Uh, a por good portion of this is um, mapping that will be done by uh, a local vendor, um, approximately 50, I think it's 53,000 of it. Uh, this again is the um, uh, performance of the airport surveys related to obstruction mapping, topographical mapping and aerial photography, and also the performance of aviation planning services to prepare an update to the existing airport layout plan, which is one we inherited from Clayton County, including the preparation of the ALP narrative report associated with the proposed improvements to the airport, uh, the Atlanta South Regional Airport. Um, again, this has to be completed before we can go ahead and start uh, doing any construction as well. Um, the EA uh, and the ALP will work simultaneously and, again, uh, have to have both done. And, again, all three of these are available for 90 percent. I will say that, as I mentioned earlier, we have 66,000 available. That money, for the most part, will be consumed with the striping, as I presented in the CROI. There is no money here yet for this, but we have two things. One is, by now, typically, the airport um, is, is would have received its $150,000 entitlement grant. Uh, that money is yet to be, in this fiscal year, federal fiscal year, granted to us. It is expected to get here within the next month or two. Um, it's been held up, as you know, in Congress and approving things. Uh, it's not been sent yet to us. It is uh, something I've been assured we're going to get. And the same on the same note, um, LPA has indicated <coughs> that they've talked to their subs as well as their, their own management. They will not bill us before September, which gives us ample time for us to be able to get um, the money and the grant so that we can get the 90 percent reimbursed before we'd have to spend any money and we'd be out um, the 10 percent at the time. And that uh, the total of these three is 173196 so our cost is $17,320 at the 10 percent. Any Mr. Uh, this this following up because this is <clears throat> the striping is one thing and right. I think common sense says that you shouldn't stripe it and then turn around and cap it and then stripe it again. But 
but we don't have any choice over that. But and in this in this matter, it's it's ninety ten. We're we're paying ten. Yes, sir. And LPA group has they're not going to bill us until September. We should have that hundred and fifty thousand. I think it's important to note that all of these things we have to put all this in place before we have our widening and lengthening yes. of the airport. Yes. So by virtue of that in order for the airport to become viable as to what we had felt like that it would in the future, these things have to be done, and that's correct, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, and it's not like something that we're having a lot of choice over, but it's also something that we're only, and I, I hate to say we're only paying 10 percent, but I mean the fact is that we are paying the 10 percent. I know that some would say that uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't take money from Washington, but we send an awful lot of money to Washington and don't get a lot of it back here to Henry County. So I, I pretty well disagree with that, uh, with that particular comment. <laughs> but anyhow, just uh, just to be sure, I mean, these are things that we don't have any choice over doing, it, and we do have a local vendor, which I think is a good thing. We got people in the county working. Also, uh, it's a 90-10, so it's costing the county 10%. Just wanted to clarify a few of those things because of the in order to get the business to the airport that we were looking for, it's got to be greater than the 4,500 foot that it is, yes. and the 5,500 foot actually brings a lot that the state came down and had conversations with us about in the past six months about what could be coming to Henry County from a business standpoint at the airport. And these are just building blocks to get that in place so that we can actually get to that point where we can bring that business into Henry County. Well, it's right. interesting because we had the discussion yesterday in the budget about Baxter, and that was one of the um, requirements they had is they had to have an airport to accommodate um, their folks that would be flying in and out. They happened to have one out there that met the requirements with the runway link. And we didn't, so we were automatically excluded from even uh, consideration on that particular project. And with 5,000 acres of developable, privately owned, not county, but privately owned developable property around that, that airport seems to be, it seems to me that it's going to be, you know, it's really going to be a good thing. The only other thing was, um, you know, it, when we were told, and, and the numbers, I, I forget the numbers, but, uh, you know, that the airport would be, like I said, once that we got the thousand foot would be very viable for those businesses. Um, there was another point that I wanted to make, but you know, I think I have a gray hair moment right now, and it's kind of left me. But anyway, just wanted to be sure that you know the ninety percent. I want that out in the public. It's a ten percent to Henry County, and the fact that these things have to be done, and that uh, you know, I, oh, the airport currently, uh, and this is a question and not a comment. Is currently operating in the black. Is that correct, Mr. Financial? Currently operating in the black. And I think that, yeah, I think that once that the contract is completed and we have that lengthened and done, and Mr. Letty, you can you can add to this uh, that the cost to the county is cut back severely because the management company is going to take on a lot of that responsibility. Right now, it's speaking of the management company and talking about being in the black, one of the things that we've been uh, uh, discussing with them and, and our, air, our airport <coughs> general manager uh, is at the present time we have uh, a fuel contract as well as an equipment attached to it, rental. And uh, they brought forth and done things to try and reduce our cost getting bids, whether it's on the equipment or whether it's on the fuel. And so they're, from a management standpoint, they're working on those items to keep the cost down uh, as well as manage it. Um, we're doing various things within the county to try to save some money as far as cutting the grass out there. Um, so what we had in the budget to try to save some money there to keep it in the black as, as, as best we can. Well, following the, uh, the purchase of the airport last summer, Henry County set up a budget for the airport in which a little over $900,000 was, was allocated for the budget for the airport. And I know I had a lot of comment, why are you taking $900,000 from Henry County and putting it over there in the budget? And that's not what we did. 
we looked at how much money the airport was generating every month, and that's the budget we set. It is operating on funds it is generating for itself. We didn't take money from the general fund and put it over there. We kept only money being generated by the airport into the airport. Is that correct? The monies that uh, we generate of fuel sales, leases of uh, the ground or hangars out there, that revenue, as estimated, was, as you said, 900000 and the corresponding expenses to run the airport was estimated to be 900000 to have a break-even budget. It wasn't the county was taking 900000 and putting it into the airport. It was to operate it with the various revenues coming in and the corresponding expenses and whatever profit we made, if you would, on the fuel sales and the income derived from the hangars and any other income we can derive, uh, we would... Uh, be creating that income. We're, uh, I think it's, uh, what is it, international in the next couple of weeks or something. We have a group that's coming in that's going to use the facilities for a couple of days and not be an interruption to the airport, but they're going to be buying fuel and some tie downs and things like that. So we'll be gaining some extra revenue from just that uh, use of the airport at that time. So there's other things that may come up in the future that can help generate some additional revenues to, uh, again, keep the cap, keep the budget itself for the airport at that break-even level of hope, and keep it, hopefully, at that level. Are there any other questions or comments pertaining to this item? If not, you have before you a resolution approving the professional agreement with the LPA group as it pertains to capital improvements at ASR, um, and it is also GDOT eligible for a 90 percent re reimbursement. And with that being said, I'll entertain a motion. <coughs> Motion to approve by Mr. Bowman. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. Thank, Thank you. The next item on the agenda is an appointment to McIntosh Trail Community Service Board. That's exhibit number 11. And we had received a request um, from McIntosh Trail from Pat McCollum, the executive director. And Susan Craig has, has uh, been an appointee on that board for a number of years. And they have requested that she be reappointed. Her term expires June the 30th of 2012. And uh, they have uh, expressed what a valuable member she has been of the board and a huge advocate. And um, if there's no issue with reappointing Ms. Craig, I will entertain a motion to do so based on the resolution before you. Motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The next item is an appointment to the Henry County Department of Family and Children's Services Board. We actually have two appointments uh, to consider today. The first one is related to Ann Grimes, who is a member currently of the DFACS Board. Her term expires June the 30th of 2012, and this is a request coming from the board that she be reappointed to that position. If there is no objection to that, you have a resolution before you that reappoints Ann Grimes to this board, and I will entertain a motion. Motion by Mr. Stamey, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. The next appointment also is pertaining to the DFACS board, and it was brought to my attention earlier that we may have a little bit of an issue with this appointment as requested, and I will turn that over to Mr. Holder for discussion of this item. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I defer to the county attorney, but these are district appointments, correct? And uh, the person whose name has been submitted does not live in District 1. So, therefore, I, I ask that this uh, be tabled until a further date. And we have a motion on the board to table and a second by Mr. Stamey. All in favor? Motion carries 5-0. All right, that brings us to an item on the agenda that we took up yesterday and delayed a decision on, and that's the discussion regarding the 2012-2013 budget. Again, Mr. Auletta presented a um, tremendous amount of in information for this board to consider, and um, so at this time, I would like to ask Mr. Arletta if you or and Mike both could come to the mic in case we have some questions about this. We're going to get this discussion underway as to what direction we need to take. We have to agree on a budget number for advertisement in the newspaper tomorrow, which is our deadline for getting this done. 
if I could, Mr. Chairman. Um, during the discussion this morning, uh, Commissioner Preston brought up an HSA program. And one of the discussions he and I have had on many occasions is it's a new type of program that employees would have to understand and learn in the short time that we had. So, but absent the discussion on what an HSA is, how it works, and whatever, what I would like to do is present Mike's bringing up three schedules I'd like to go over with you to uh, explain um, for you what all this means. Uh, uh, Commissioner Preston mentioned a substantial savings. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, when you have a savings in insurance, it's either on the backs of the insurance company, the employees, or the county. And for the county to save money, either the employees or the insurance company is the one that have to bear the cost. So what I'd like to do is, is take a presentation. Part of, the, part of what I didn't present yesterday, because it didn't come up, but since it did this morning, I would like to have this in front of you. Um, your approval of the contract this morning with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, as presented, is what's been what you approved. Part of that uh, contract and I'm not sure that it was in there to approve an HSA in it, uh, but nonetheless, uh, let me start out with uh, this schedule that you have. Um, it's got a bunch of numbers. I was scratching them on there uh, this morning as, as I was sitting there because of uh, trying to respond to it. Um, let, me, let me start out with the other schedule first. Yesterday, I, I used this schedule, and I didn't, and didn't uh, uh, put Mr. Preston's uh, April 5th uh, discussion on um, HSA. And what you will see here is this is the county as proposed, the same as was yesterday, with the existing rates for both the county and the employees to be the same, again, coming to the $12 million cost, and also the final uh, cost of the employees at $1.6 million. Six. Um, where Mr. Uh, Preston has indicated a $2 million savings, uh, it's on these numbers. And, and uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Preston, you in your presentation, which I've got a copy of and I'll put up here, you have flipped the numbers on the 85 and the 80 as far as the numbers of people, and it may not make a lot of difference, but I, I put them in the proper uh, 80 and 85, if you would, unless you were thinking everybody would switch. Well, if you notice, there's also a maximum expense of the county and then the lowest possible expense of the county on the far right. That was to give us best, worst case, just from a cost analysis. So there's no surprises. And you'll okay. notice they're pretty tightly bound in there, so there's you don't have to worry about that variance too okay. much. Okay, well, let me just, and, and I'll put these up here and just make it put in perspective. Again, under either scenario, the 100% the plan goes away. Um, the uh, plan for the 90-10, which goes to 85-15, again, the rates that uh, uh, Commissioner Preston has proposed in that plan are still, again, at the uh, increase of from $51 to $125 for an uh, individual. Uh, with spouse goes from 120 to 275 and then the um, with child only. 110 to 290, which is $180 a month increase for a, a spouse or, or individual, an employee with child only, not spouse. They would be paying $180 more. And a family goes from 140 to 350, so the family coverage would increase under that program by $210 a month. Um, go, moving down then, and again, you can see the removal of the POS, which was uh, Commissioner uh, Preston indicated this morning, which is to eliminate and replace it with an HSA. Um, in doing so, then you take the uh, employee on the uh, 8020. Again, the rate presently is 15 for an employee, and it goes to 90 under Commissioner Preston's proposal. And the 36 goes to 145, and the 33 to 160, and the 42 goes to 250 under the 8020 plan. 
And again, the 80-20 plan remains at 80, whereas the 90 went to 85-15. And in both cases, the $100, as I indicated on the uh, uh, emergency, goes up to $150 this year. The HMO 80-20 has a $1,000 deductible um, and so on. The HSA uh, has a $2,500 deductible, 5000 for family, as compared to a $1,000 on the 80-20 for the HMO. Again, they're both 80-20s, and there is another difference I'll show in just a minute. But they're both 80-20 plans, except the deductible on the 80-20 HMO is $1,000 and 3000 and under the HSA it goes to $2,500 and 5000 Again, the rates are uh, proposed here were 40, 55, 75, and 100. Those would be compared to the 80, 20 above HMO of 15, 36, 33, and 42. So you can see each of them goes up from $25 to $58 a month and ending, and, and the employees would have instead of a $1,000 deductible, a $2,500 deductible on, on that plan. The other schedule I gave you, there's one that doesn't have a lot of pencils on it, pencil writing on it, and the other one does. I'm going to put the pencil up because I scratched through the, the numbers here just to make a, a make some comparisons for you. I'm just going to take the HMO 80% and the HSA 80% because they're both HS both 80-20 plans, but there is a significant difference, and that is on the 80-20, the way the policy now is uh, written, the way it's accepted. There's a $1,000 deductible individual, 3,000 family, max on the family. But the out-of-pocket um, is, and the out-of-pocket is identical. So basically once the $1,000 is met, there is no additional out-of-pocket. If you take the HSA, which is an 80-20 as well, the deductible for the employee goes from $1,000 under the HMO to $2,500 and a $5,000 deductible, but the out-of-pocket is $5,000 and $10,000. So what that means is once the $2,500 deductible has been met, then the 80-20 kicks in and the employee will pay 20% of the cost over the $2,500 they paid and met and go ahead and continue to pay up to $5,000. So the dif difference individual is significant from $1,000 to $5,000 on family, from $3,000 to $10,000. Um, if you look to the middle, the premium cost between the HSA and the HMO, the HM, uh, HMO is at the top is $306.89, the total premium, and under the H, uh, HSA it's $263 or a $43 reduction um, to $43 reduction, I'll come back. You can see in the pencil figures where it says 280-20 HMO, the difference in the premiums under the HMO to the HSA is a reduction of 43 to $140 on the family. Now to the right of that, <coughs> the employee, uh, Commissioner Preston's recommendations for employees is $40, 60, uh, 55 and 75 and $100 for each of the four categories. To the left, I put what the present 80-20 plan is it's 15, 36, 33, and 42. So including taking an additional $1,500 deductible as well as another uh, $4,000 in out-of-pocket increase from 80 HMO to 80 HSA, they'll also be paying 25 to $58 more per month for the coverage I just described. Um, let's see what else. Can I, can I yeah, jump in I a little just, bit? I think I've, I think I've got it. Um, let me address, first of all, I don't want to go into the super details of health savings accounts unless we were doing an enrollment meeting, and then I'd be more than welcome to get up there and go to the ins and outs because I've actually used a health savings account personally. What Also, that added benefit of that deductible that you mentioned, you get a tax deduction on your personal income tax return. It's not as an itemized deduction. It's on the front page, so everybody gets to take it no matter whether you're itemized or not. It's an incredible thing. If you don't use your health savings account, you get to use it for retirement spending in the future too. So these are things, like I said, I can give you an education on how great it gives you flexibilities where you get to keep more of your money for yourself. Now the second question, how many people lose their job with this recommendation? 
It's zero. And that's what I hate that we're, we're, I'm trying to come up with ideas. I see that we're $10 million short with the county's money. And I was trying to figure out ways that would be a win for the county, meaning we find the shortfall without costing a single job. And I pulled together the research to make sure I wasn't just crazy about this. Like I said, I brought this up yesterday. The National Conference of State Legislatures publishes every year data for what the average premiums are, not just for the nation, but by the state. And what they had for the, their most recent data was for, it was published in August of 2011. I'm sure it will come out in August of 2012 this year. But it's the 2010. So these rates are even lower than where we are because we've seen 10 to 15 percent premium increases over the last two years. So these are even much lower. The average on single, $80. You can see the majority of our employees are 15. You can see the employee with spouse, $260.67. Is this $36 I see here? And then you can see they don't have employee with children listed on their data, but they do have family. Families listed at $308.50, whereas we're currently at $42. That's, um, as you can see, there's a little, you ask, I hate that you keep putting it on the backs of the employees because this is not us versus them. This is a county, it's not us versus the citizens. Well, we, I, but and, and, Mr. Letta, this is, I'm just trying to put out ideas. I, and I, I hate not, that we keep beating up my ideas. If y'all don't like it, nobody I'm has to beating, vote I'm, for it. But, Mr. But President, I'm not beating up your idea. I've taken the facts. This is your worksheet that you presented, and this is your worksheet that I'm using to calculate this. And, and as to whether I'm putting it on the backs, I'm taking your presentation of where you are asking the county employees to absorb the monies that are on the sheet of paper. So I'm not, uh, I'm not making any comment on the backs of. I'm just merely stating the facts that are on this. You piece did of say paper. that on the backs. You did. You did okay, make then, that comment. Okay. Then if I did, in my interpretation is, if the county employees are the ones that are going to end up having to pay more out of pocket, in addition to the 80, uh, 90 going to 85 whether it's on the backs or whatever else, the savings to the county, as I said it before, there's three ways to cut health insurance costs. One is the insurance company, the employee, or the county. And to get the county to save it, the insurance company's got to come forward. The insurance company has reduced the premium, as I said, from 43 to $140. To get the amount of savings, this is why I, I brought this up here, you've indicated there's a two plus million dollars of savings that the county could have to reduce the budget shortfalls. My point is to get that $2 million plus shortfall, going back to the 80-20 up above, if we continue to have 1,071 people, and the reason they're there, because that's where they are now. To your point of education, I've had HSAs. I think they're great programs. To educate everybody today in an understanding of an HSA and the credits and all the things that go with it, is a process that you have to go ahead and get everybody on board with to jump down below. I will point out also that you have here on your 8020 where it says county cost per employee. Under the 8020, it's 260268 for an employee. If you go to the HSA, the cost to the county is 2677 or approximately $75 more per employee in the HSA on an annualized basis. That's times 12. Is I did that on purpose, though, because I was trying to treat this as a cap. When I designed this spreadsheet, I was trying to treat it more like a cafeteria plan where we give every employee about the same basket of money and let them make use of it. So you don't, if you don't need Cadillac insurance because you're a super healthy person, maybe you jog, work out, and you want to have that money for the future, we got an option for you. If you have health concerns, as Mr. Bowman, yes, Commissioner Bowman yesterday was talking about overweight people. We have an option for you there with some of our, uh, we had something for everybody. It, bottom line is, because I don't, I don't want to be made the boogeyman of, of the employees, because I, I, I truly don't believe so. I'm trying to find us money without costing a single job, because it's either, as you've said it, and y'all have said it in the past, the majority of our budget is people. So if you're not going to look at benefits when we find out that maybe well, I don't have to say maybe. They are much less than market, meaning they're much better than market. Our costs to our employees are below market on these things, and we're now short $10 million. We can say, okay, we have to get creative and find ways that we can get this money without costing a single job or we can raise taxes. 
And I got to tell you, in this economic environment, especially after doing the research on millage on the communities that seem to have economic development going, and that level seems to be a right around the low 30s or sub 30s uh, on your mill total millage rate, I don't know if, if raising taxes is in the best interest of Henry County. I'm, I'm not here to present raising taxes. I'm not here to discuss. But I'm, you're, I'm here you're to knock present, them down. I'm, he I'm an here to take and validate your $2 million savings and how the $2 million of savings is derived. That's all I'm doing. I'm using your worksheet to say in order for the county to have a $2 million, uh, actually going back to this original sheet. If you had the surcharge, it's over $3 million. And surcharge is not considered here, and that's a discussion for the board to have as you started yesterday. I'm merely trying to address something that was presented this morning sure. that has never been presented as part of something when you mentioned $2 million or $3 million savings. I wanted to present what that meant to the board because I didn't do that yesterday. But what this says here is the $12 million cost would go down a little bit, but, and the county cost would go down, but the employee cost goes from a million six to three million nine, which is a $2.3 million savings uh, to the county, but it's a cost to the employee because the premiums they're paying, just in premiums they're paying, this has nothing to do with the additional out-of-pocket they're going to have or the deductible they're going to have. So well, the starting point is that the county would spend less money by putting that cost into the employee premium portion because the rates are the same. And as a result, the employees would pay more money to the tune of the $2 million you're talking about. The county would not because the employees would be paying that premium that we have, no change. And at the end of the day, if they had to go to the doctor, hospital, whatever, if they so chose to take the HSA, yes, there is an account that can be set up and all the mechanics that go with it, I understand. But on the tax savings, if our employees are in the 10% tax bracket, not the 40% tax bracket, they're going to save 10% of the $2,500 out of pocket they're going to spend. That is, yes, a tax saving if they even, you know, they can get that, let's put it that way. But at the end of the day, the 10% they save is still cash that they're spending for which they'll get 10% back or 15%, depending on their tax rate, back to them. I'm not arguing with you. I'm merely trying to present for the board's education the program you presented and where this $2 million is coming from so they can make the same educated decision as to whether this is the way to go. So I'm not fighting you. I'm not arguing with you. All I'm trying to do is take what you presented as a way to save money, how it will affect the population. Can you discuss the, um, the um, deductible for, uh, for the individual and families in more detail with the HSA? <clears throat> the deductible on the HSA? Correct. The deductible is $2,500 an individual, $5,000 per family. But in each policy, there is not only a deductible provision, there is an out-of-pocket provision. So that once you meet your deductible, the 80% kicks in. So the first $2,500 of cost that you incur is yours. Once that cost has been occurred, the then you go and whatever, you pay 20% of it. What am I looking at here? It says, um, it says uh, 5000 per individual and uh, 10000 per family. Right. So that to the extent you've covered the $2,500 deductible, employee only, mm -hmm. and they've had $2,500 worth of cost, medical cost, they have to absorb that $2,500 first. If they then incur another $500, they're going to have to pay $100 of it at the 80-20 rate. Okay? 20, 20, excuse me, 20, what say, $100, right. And then the insurance carrier will cover the $400. If that scenario continues until the total of the $2,500 deductible they paid plus the 20% that they're paying hits $5,000, they will continue to pay the 20%. Under the present HMO, the deductible and the out-of-pocket happen to be the same. Call it luck, call it good negotiating, call it a good program for the county. But in that particular case, if the program that the person's on at the 80 HMO covers the first $1,000 of cost, the 80 doesn't even apply because the out-of-pockets and, and the deductible are even, and they've covered the deductible and the out-of-pocket. <clears throat> So there will be no additional cost to the employee under that program. 
So, so based on based on the average salary of a Henry County employee, do you see um, a high percentage of employees selecting this option? The key the key is, is, is Commissioner uh, uh, Preston indicated. It's education. It's, it's not a extremely complex, but if you're not used to numbers and understand taxes and a lot of other things that go with an HSA and you've never had one, it's an educational process to understand. What the employees, I believe, will hear, whether it's a tax savings in an account, it's transferable, and all the things that go with it, what I believe the employees will hear is, I've got to put $2,500 of my money out for the uh, first $2,500 of cost, or for a family, $5,000, as opposed to $500 under the 85, as well as $1,000 under the 80%. And, and to make the point, last year we had a 100% plan. I could show you and write down, and I'm sure the employees were shown last year, it was not in their best interest to take the 100% plan. Why? The premium there was so high compared to the 90% plan that it was better to get the 90% plan, pay the 10%, save a whole bunch of money in premium, and they'd come out dollars a hit. That's mathematical calculations. Commissioner Preston, you're nodding your head yes, so you understand where I'm coming from. So, and, but we had last year 200 employees, I believe, that were in that 100% plan. As I said, I can educate all day, but at the end of the day, the employees have their own taste of what they feel they need to have to protect themselves and their families and how they're going to manage their budgets, how they're going to spend their money. And an HSA is not something just you throw on somebody to the extent, to the extent that this calculation going to strictly an HSA would in fact create $2 million of savings on an apples to apples basis. That's one thing, but as I said, in pointing out the premiums, we're only reducing the premium from 43 to $140 going to an HSA for the same 80-20. And the county cost, as you can see, based on the deductions, is actually higher to the county under the HSA plan versus the HMO plan. And again, I understand, uh, Commissioner Preston, that was the way you set the higher premium to discourage people from using. And that's used all the time for all insurance programs. Not picking on you, but I'm saying that's the way all programs, if you want to get people to a different program, the higher rate. It's the same thing last year with the 100% where the rates were so high, you'd have thought nobody would have taken it. But again, we had 200 people out of 1,200 take it because that was their appetite for how much risk they wanted to take if they were going to have hospital bills for themselves or doctor bills or whatever illnesses they had that said, I don't want to be coming out of pocket, you know, that's why I have 100% and I'll pay the premium and everybody does it for different reasons. I have one statement that I want to take a step back and let other commissioners have comments is that, and I think Fred said it best is when, well, I'll, I'll kind of add to what Fred said is there's, it is true, there's no decisions we make at this point are easy. I mean, we, we're past the point whether it's the employees have to give a little bit more on their health benefits or whether we're going to ask our, our citizens to pay more in taxes or we're going to have to cut jobs. I mean, there are no easy decisions at this point. But what I was looking at was I say, okay, let's consider it sure does look like it's raining outside to me. When you have your tax base drop by 15 percent, those don't happen every year. So I do think we ought to touch the emergency reserves, three to four million dollars. We could do this health savings account option, which still gives good insurance but takes away the Cadillac type coverage and modernizes the system. And if we don't give back the furloughs, we cover 70% of the shortfall. If we even if we gave back the fur, you know, meaning we gave the employees back their furloughs, we still cover 63% of the shortfall without raising one single tax in this county. And that, that's that's powerful to me. And that's the only reason I wasn't trying to cause issues or trouble. I was just trying to come up with creative ideas that didn't cost one single job. And, and again, I'm not debating you or arguing with you. I'm merely taking the facts you, you gave me to get to this $2 million savings and said, again, this is where the $2 million in savings is coming from. And as I showed you in the numbers and calculating it out, the $2 million of savings takes the employee contribution from a million six to three million nine. That only means the employees are going to be paying that much more 
in total of all the county 1,255 or 1,318 employees that are on it, they're going to have to absorb that additional $2.3 million in cost. The premiums don't change, and as I said, when you look at it policy by policy, comparing 80 percent to 80 percent, the amount of savings is not there on, a, on an employee-employee basis uh, because of the fact that the cost is actually $75 more. Again, I'm not up here to argue with you. I'm not up here to debate it. I wanted to present the facts that I didn't present yesterday because it didn't come up as an HSA option. This is the HSA option as you presented it, your worksheet, and again, translation into dollars and cents so that the board would have the ability to make that decision. If that's the way they want to go, that is the choice of the board. That's what will happen. I, I'm not here making decisions the board needs to make. I'm just merely pointing out so the board can make the, the best decision they can based on all the facts versus the statement, there's $2 million that can be saved. It can be if this is what you do, and if you so choose to do it as a board, then that's what it is. So my apologies to you, Commissioner Preston, if it sounds like I've been arguing with you. I'm merely trying to present those facts. Well, I think um, we've got to present a number um, on the budget today before we leave here. So you, you handed out scenarios yesterday. And the way I viewed the scenarios and the way you did your presentation, you said these are our needs. And then you included some things that different commissioners had asked to be put back in there. And then you came up with a grand total of what that budget would look like if every request that you received was put back in there. So I think in order to work back to a number, that everybody's comfortable with, we're going to have to talk about those particular issues and see what the board's thoughts are on those. So with that being said, the two issues that I think probably need to be talked about first are the employee longevities and the public safety compression. Those are two items that were included in your scenario, and I want to toss that out to the board first of all to see what your thoughts are on adding those two items into the budget and, this and, year. And again, just to, to make comment, it was a request of some board members to take and put the public safety item and quantify it, which is what I did. Um, what I did is I added the longevity, as I indicated yesterday, to say if we're going to take care of public safety, 60% of the employees, at a to up to a 10 or 12% increase in pay to cover the longevity they have, I said there ought to be something at least to compensate the people that work alongside of them, and that's why I proposed three-quarters of a percent. I calculated, calculated last night on a $28,000 employee, a three-quarter of a percent increase, annual increase, is $210. That was how small the proposal was, but it was just a token, I guess you can call it, if nothing else, to show there was something for them while giving public safety. So. These two <clears throat> are to be considered as one because one wasn't to say do this one or the other. One was to say I felt if the, if the commission wanted to go ahead and take care of compression and the public safety, I thought consideration should be given to the other. It's your choice to say you'll do one or the other or neither. Again, I was just presenting it at the request of the board, and I added the other to make sure that the board considered the other employees as well. So the question for the board members on employee longevity and public safety compression, is it on or off the table? On the table? Ms. Preston? What I'd like to do is um, I think if, if we're looking at austerity and cuts that have to occur, I'd like them to come from all departments except public safety, but I don't feel comfortable necessarily increasing the millage in a time when the tax base goes down 15%. To, to give pay raises to anybody. I, as, I know we have an issue, and I've talked to law enforcement. I think the world of what they're doing, but we, I, I don't see how we fund it in, the, in this economy. All right, Mr. Stamey? I, I think I'm going to leave it on the table. I think there's still options we need to look at. I don't, I'm not ready to take it off yet. Mr. Holder? As far as taking it off or leaving it on, I don't think that's a question now. If I had to vote right now, I'd take it off the table. But I don't think it's the time to vote. I think we are looking at a number for the budget whether it's $115 million or $112 million or whatever the number is that we need. Here's why I'm saying this. Today, we're not going to set the millage today. 
All we're doing is accepting the budget with a number. Why are we not going to uh, set the millage? Because the tax digest won't be back to us till August. So how are we going to determine what the millage is going to be by not even knowing what the digest is going to be? So what we're doing today is accepting a number. And ladies and gentlemen, the budget can be amended at any time. Am I not correct, Mr. Bush? Yes, sir. So we are adopting a number today. And how we arrive at funding the number is going to be determined by, number one, what the digest is. Number two, what kind of uh, reserves that we have at the time that we want to take away from to offset a millage increase if there's a millage increase or by how much the millage increase you know that's determined by the by the tax digest we're looking at projections now we don't actually have the real numbers so I think we're getting ahead of the fact as to how and what we're leaving in or taking out if we uh, accept a number one of the numbers that have been presented to us and say this is what we are this is the budget that we're we're going to adopt then we have many different means and ways by which to to accommodate or to uh, make that happen that's just my opinion mr bowman did you have a comment uh, uh, well i mean i agree commissioner holder i mean we we're you know we we're, we're shooting at something and we have we you know we're, we're trying to hit a target we don't we don't know what that target's going to be yet. I mean, I have to agree with that. Now, as far as taking something off the table or leaving something off the table, I think that comes when we know the dollars that we actually have to deal with. I, I don't. Can can I, I add mean, something? You know, to set a to set a budget. I mean, you know, we we could say, okay, we're going to set the same budget this year that we had last year, and then we got to amend that budget when we get to that point. I mean, we know that we know that a mills. $4 million, you know, 3.9, 4 point, whatever. But we know a mill's $4 million, and, and so, you know, we know that if we said, okay, we're going to use last year's budget, we know that we're about what last year was 112, and this year's, we're talking about 105, plus or minus, just using round numbers. So we know that we're two mills off of what last year's budget was going to be, and, you know, we've all talked about what we could do as far as taking money from reserve, if that's what we need to do. Uh, I think the, the phrase that uh, that Brian has used is, uh, it's a rainy day fund and it's raining. I actually used that about three years ago. Uh, so, I mean, I understand where we're going. And, and so, really. He said I copied you. Is that what y'all heard? He said, yeah. he said he used it three years ago. And now he was terrible. I don't understand why you would do that. But anyway, that's, I mean, you were, I'm sorry, but that's okay. I'm just picking up. No, but really, seriously, uh, I have to agree with Commissioner Holder. We're, we're trying to hit a target, and we don't know what the target is yet. And, and, and you know, let's, let's put a number down. Let's pin a number. You can put the number in the paper, you know, and, and how we get to it is how we get to it. And if we got to amend it, we got to amend it, and we got to do what we got to do. I, I the, the number that we pick today will be good based on the calendar through June 30th. And then if any amendment to that happens, it'll have to ha occur in July because the budget process, as I outlined by calendar, says by May 31st that number in the process to have a public hearing and then an adoption. If there's a change to that number, I'm not saying we're, if there's a change, it would require starting the entire notification process all over again and that would make us not be able to make the May 31st deadline. But whatever number is adopted, or today, is, it's adopted. How we get there is what we've got to work on. And then in July, if you so choose to change, you can do it in July. But for now, whatever number you pick is the number that we're going to have to live with through the process. Right. My suggestion is, you know, we're the $10 million short just to, to break even and then there's that furlough million one hundred twenty six thousand if you sat here today and that's a hundred sixteen thousand and some change if you said that was the number and the reason I say that is if you don't include the furloughs normally our first furlough day is the fourth of July and it'd be really hard to change that before the fourth of July but let's say that you left that at 116 million then in July 
we've had time to, to see what the health insurance are going to do, so we'll know what kind of savings we may have there if you decide to you know, incorporate the HSA. You'll also have better numbers from the tax commissioner to show you exactly what a mill tax is, not guessing it's $4 million because of exemptions. And here's the thing, a lot of those exemptions are also going away because there's, I want to think, 200 of the 54,000 houses that still have that frozen homestead exemption. So a lot of the exemptions aren't in place anymore other than uh, the, the original $14,000 or $15,000 amount of money. So you could sit here in the middle of July before you adopt the digest and know exactly what your pieces are and change your budget to, to be that. And if it even included furlough days going back in, you could put furlough days in in July and then you know, figure out during the year when you want to put them in. But you're right. It's, it's a number that's good. You know, we need that number, and we need to have a public hearing and an adoption without changing that number. And then once you get the additional information that you guys are talking about, you can make the adjustment in July. All right. With that being said. And one other thing. This is not unique to this, this year. This is something that occurs every year in the process of, of, of adopting a budget. The, the time that the digest is back, uh, the time that it's required by law that a budget be adopted, this is not new. This is something that has occurred as long as I've been here. And, uh, so it's nothing new. It's just in the past we've been accustomed to growth and digest and, and an upward economy. Now we're going in the other direction. And, and that is in, in reverse, but the, the time elements are not. Would anyone like to put a number out there for discussion? What is the 116, whatever? That would be. No, I mean, is that an even 116? Oh, no, sir, it's not. 116, no. 7. I'm just taking 115.5 and 100.1.1. And That's it. It's almost 116.7. 116,700,000. Yeah. I mean, not, not, not to be the lone wolf here, but that, that means that we it didn't lower it any. Because, I mean, that's what we don't want to have, because the budget, the tax rates went to collections are going to go down 15%. We don't want to have the budget be lower than the 115 that we currently are or 112 you you plus want, the accounting you, issues you want to take the 116 693 and back 15 well, percent out of it i was <laughs> i don't know my thought was with some of the th items i propose is that we could take five million out of the take it down to 110 He wants to take five million out of it based on his suggestion. His, um, I guess that's because I don't know how we get to one fifteen, one sixteen without raising the taxes substantially. And I understand what Commissioner Holder is saying about because I agree that it would be nice to have the actual numbers, but we're about to lose one of the most the, the low lying fruit, as I call it, with the surcharges and the insurance. After that goes away. A lot of our tools out of the toolbox go away without having to now cut people or raise taxes. You know, the only thing, <clears throat> to the extent the board would like to enter the HSA for the $2.3 million of savings or actually raise the rates on the other policies as well, not just HSA, because it's equal. It's equal if you would because the premiums are higher, but the employee cost is higher. So the savings are coming as well from the increases in the 80-20 or 90-10 rates. So to the extent you're considering lowering it from this year's 112 to 110 to pick up $2 million, by that means, and you don't choose to do that, and you've set the 110, again, up till June 30th, we got to figure out how we're going to present the budget at 110 without that if you don't opt to do that. So my point, you're walking into that. Not, you're just walking into saying that if you set it at 110, looking for the two million from, and you can't do it now. You've lost that tool. And and if you don't get it now, you may have the option. Well, you don't have. Either way, a decision is, needs to be made on, or we don't do open enrollment, and we got a bigger problem in getting the employees something. Somebody brought up it this morning when you were talking about insurance. You know, the policy is the policy. It's not approving 
the rates. But what policy we have requires we give the employees what their deduct what the various programs are, what their deductibles are, what their um, out of pocket is, et cetera, et cetera. The policy you approved. Now we need to step back and say, are they going to pay the same as last year, more than last year, offer the HSA with the higher deductibles and out of pocket and so on and so forth. That, again, as, as, as Tara said, is that you know we pushed it back again to next week. They're scrunched to do it in a, in a three-week period. It's a lot of work to do with it. And uh, again, somebody mentioned having a piece of paper and you've got to give it to them to explain what it is or options are. So that still becomes something that's needed whether it's done here by boat, uh, how you want to do it, email me, and if I get the emails and it's 33, what do I do then, or how do you, you know, I don't know how you want to proceed with that. For the sake of moving things along, and uh, I'll make a motion that we adopt the number of a one of 115 million five sixty six two sixty two, which is budget scenario number one that was presented by the staff. We have a motion on the floor for 115 566 262 by Mr. Holder, and we have a second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor of that? All opposed? You're in favor? I'm in favor, yes, I am. Okay, and all opposed. All right, those in favor are Bowman, Holder, and Stamey, and the opposition is Preston and Holmes. So our number is 115,566,262, and that'll be, I guess, what you advertise in the paper. Scenario that includes the furloughs. That, was, that includes giving the people back. No, no, sir. 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 No, for a million one, you can get rid of furloughs that way by using the million one, correct or not? One thing, I mean, really, one thing we talked about it, is that we would, we would do away with the furloughs, but then if, if I understand all the insurance talk that we've gone through now for about an hour, that we went through for an hour and a half or so yesterday, is that, yeah, we're going to give them the furlough days and then turn around and charge them two weeks' pay extra just to keep their insurance. That don't make any sense to me. I mean, you know, we're, we're giving them a week back and taking two weeks back away from them. So, I mean, One of the statements that Commissioner Preston made is we lose the tools. We don't lose the tools. If we sat here today, sir? after open enrollment, you lose the health insurance discussion. That's right. That's why even if you, you've already voted for the 115, we still have to have an answer on the insurance before we can do the open enrollment. Because y'all need, need to think about the insurance and where you want to go with that and get back with them and let them know as they're working in the next couple of weeks to solidify those numbers, correct? It's got to be this week. So we this week. Next week. As a matter of fact, they've got to put the forms together so it's not like on Friday we say put the forms together to start Monday. They've got to schedule meetings and all the other things to go with it. and. Mr. Holmes. If the 115 doesn't include furloughs, then I want to change my vote to a yes for the 115. If it does not include furloughs. No, furloughs, again, the 115 number, if you, want, if you wanted to take the furloughs out, the employees, this gets in, the, in and out. To eliminate furloughs, you have to go to 116 because the cost of the furloughs is 1.1. You don't have to, but I'm saying if you take the present shortfall, which says there are four furloughs in the 115 savings, if you would, of a million dollars. If you yeah, want, but we have the number to establish, right, a budget, just, and we can amend that number to take those furlough days and take them out. Correct. I mean, that's, that, I, I just want to be sure I understand. You can, you can, as long as you reach that number, you can do it. You can balance it by, you know, taking and, an apple here and an orange there, exactly. and taking out something exactly. else yeah. over I'll here. Also, Mike, you mentioned the fact of the first furlough day normally was July the 4th. We just won't do a furlough day until... It, that can be one that would just have to move back to a little different day unless it's right. amended to... You're also saying you're going to do four furlough. What happens if four goes to two or four goes to zero? It doesn't right. make any difference. Fourth of July, Labor Day. <laughs> but you got your numbers. 
so we just need Which, to a, we need to work I, I to asked make that work. I asked the board this, and that is, I don't know how you're going to get back to us so we can get the number on it. I apologize, we've talked an hour and a half on it. I've tried to take, again, a, present, a proposal that was made that for your consideration and make sure you understood it and the employees understood it, of what you're, again, am going to put out there. Um, if, if somebody calls me up, I'll take that. If, if I get emails, I'll take that. But the issue becomes if I get three on three, what three votes for and three votes against or no clear past, what do I do at the end of the week? Let me ask you a question, Fred. I'm not endorsing the HHSA, what the program he's wanting to put out there, but why can't that still be an option for the employees and let the program dic dic dictate the amount of savings? If there's 500 people put in the program, then quite naturally we all absorb the savings. But if there's no takers, then there's no program. Well, but there's no savings if nobody's. If you have a plan that's only $42 a month that's giving you high level of coverage, no, but nobody's going to take the health savings account. The, the issue at hand is is not the HSA program again. It is a program. It has a higher deductible. I apologize, Commissioner Bowman. But what you have to study is the rates the employees are paying under Plan A, what was proposed, and Commissioner uh, Preston's $2 million savings to raise the monthly rate. And whether it's the HSAs or other, all of them except all of them have an increase to the present rate that the county does not have an increase in premium. So we're taking the existing premium from last year and saying the county was paying this much, you're paying this much, as proposed by Commissioner Preston. You take the amount we were paying, you reduce it, and put it over here. That's that's the difference to get the savings. Is that quick enough? Oh. Thanks, sir. And the other issue still is that of the smoking and the spousal. Commissioner, Commissioner Preston brought that up again, and that is putting it in uh, as an additional savings. And again, that's two other items that were discussed yesterday for your consideration to put in or not put in. My first comment on that, and I, I won't go into great detail, but there's, I, I know there's people that have their insurance with their spouse. So are we going to give them the same thing that we're going to take away from the, employ the other employee? There's a couple of hundred employees, obviously, because we got more than that, that are not on the county program. So shouldn't we, in fairness, Give them the same $25 a month and let them put it in their pocket because they're paying for insurance with their spouse. I mean, if we're going to take it away from one, shouldn't we give it to the other? Well, let me ask this question then. Because sure. if you have a family versus a single individual, the county pays between six and $7,000 additional just because you're married and have a family. Does that, is that fair as well? I mean, that's, that's the thing, Commissioner Bowman, is that we don't – I'm just looking for ways – it's not fair if the if tobacco use specifically costs us more health insurance wise as a count on our renewals part of the renewals was that POS being at 150 so they want to push the policy in term you know the, the premium rates up on us I'm just saying that we ought to recapture that lifestyle choice and its impact on the, the the county like I said so we don't raise taxes and do other things fire people the other thing the spousal surcharge if we're hundred and twenty dollars to hundred fifty dollars cheaper than what other people are paying for family coverage a month, it's 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 a windfall for the businesses as well as the other government entities that their employees are coming over to the county, and it costs us. Well, on the Must not be. There's 200 and something people that are not in our plan. We have 85 percent of our. Must not be a windfall for everybody. 85 percent of our people take our insurance. I think that's a pretty good indicator that we got great insurance. Well, it's actually an indi indicator that they want our insurance. But I mean, really, at the end of the day, I mean, you're going to take a smoker. Listen, I detest smoking. I can't stand to be around it. Okay, but I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I I would refute the fact that smokers are the most. Are the ones that uh, cause all the health problems. What about the people who are overweight? I mean, there's heart problems with that. There's diabetic problems with that. There's joint problems with that. I mean, there's tons of problems with that. But we're going to pick one group out and say, okay, that group's going to do it. I, I mean, no. I mean, you know, government. I mean, how many more? What are we? What else are we going to dip into? Okay, you, you drive too much, so let's just charge you money for, you know, driving your car too much. I, you know, it's, it just don't make any sense to me. I'm sorry, but. Well, no, I'm not sorry. I'm really not sorry because at the end of the day, you want to charge somebody that spouse is on it, but you don't want to give somebody who's 
who's on their spouses the same $25 a month. I mean, no, uh uh, no, no, sir, no, sir. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry. By the way, I, I don't dislike smokers. I don't despise them, but I do want them to pay their fair their, their portion of the what they, their expenses. Let me rephrase that. I don't despise the people. I despise the habit. Right. I sit and watch my dad die one night because of emphysema, where he was struggling for his last breath. So you know, I've seen family members die from smoking. So I detest the act, not the person. If I said the person, I apologize for that to anybody that does. I have family members that smoke, well, we but I don't to, like it. I, I, don't, I don't want to carry on another hour with this, but the Why smoker not? is always the one that gets nailed. What about the people that are alcoholics that, that we have, the, or that are, excuse me, heavy drinkers? Heavy what problems does that create? How, how many wrecks does that occur? How many homes does that destroy? How many families that don't have income because of the habit? So we can pick any one apart that we want to and do it, but it's always tobacco or the smoker that gets nailed. Always. Again, I, I, I put those surcharge figures at less than Commissioner Preston's request to at least put it on for the consideration. It's for you to consider. If you so choose you don't want it, it won't go on there. If you so choose you do, then we can. But the issue is i got to figure out how I'm going to make a decision based on no decision. So please get with the county manager this week, and if you haven't already expressed it in a way that was clearly understood today, let him, let him know. He's not really, I wouldn't consider him to be dense, so you probably have gotten it from several sitting up here. Do I go if the if four? If the, you have to go with the, with the majority. the majority. So if I end up with four commissioners one way or the other, at least four commissioners one way or the other, then whatever that is, is what I can proceed with. Yes. That's what I, I want I think to know. everybody would be in agreement with that. Okay. You take a break. I need to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> I don't know. You might need to take a drink. <laughs> I've never smoked one in my life, and I'm about ready to start. <laughs> I think say this. Or not, I'm ready to start. I think this budget's going to cost us all alcohol and, and smoking. We all going to take I got the overweight already, so, so I'll just go for it. We've got to eat more. we got to eat more. we got to eat. Yeah. We're going to get drunk while we eat, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. Um, we're going to move on to public comment. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Fred. Um, for those who were actually able to withstand the Marathon Commission meeting and are still here for public comment, the first one I want to recognize is Dr. Sheila Maxwell. Is Dr. Maxwell still here? Okay, she left. Janet Turner, I don't see Ms. Turner. Okay. Dr. Flynn, I don't see Dr. Flynn either. Um, Pastor Ikamani is not here either, I don't believe. All right. Mr. James Haney, were you able to stay with us for the whole meeting? I did. But if you have to go, you have to go. So let me say one thing. Come, come on up to the come on, come on up to the microphone um, because we certainly want to hear from you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, come again. I was here last year. I don't bother you too much. Just once a year. And Not then a bother you, at all. Then you remember me for a long time after that, probably. Uh, I live in the Old South subdivision off Bull Conyers Road. We have 12 homes that are located in, in that particular community. There are three homes that are directly across the O'Connor's Road from there. And what I'm coming here today, and I don't, I, I, I'm going to leave this with you. I think it would take a little bit longer to, to read it. But I'm concerned. I think I can say the whole story if you just look at the pictures when you have an opportunity. I spent a lot of time going down and watching people come up the highway. General over here told me, said, well, we, we reduced the speed limit. That's great but you didn't reduce the speed. They're still going 45 and 50. You can look at the pictures. I snapped the picture when I saw the very, very, very top of the vehicle. And that's how long it took for that vehicle to come, in my, come into my uh, camera. And, and then you find that within about four seconds, they're on the street that I'm coming out of. My most important 
part is right here. During my effort to have the citizens of Old South Community sign the attachment, that's where they sign, as you, you have an attachment there with all the signatures. Um, there are two special needs children that live in the community. They, along with others, ride the bus to and from school. In talking with the bus drivers, I learned that children have been injured due to the bus when turning into or off of Old Conyers Road has had to quickly exit or enter the road. The injuries weren't serious, but could have been, could have been had the bus been hit by oncoming traffic. Board members, you got you got to think about this. Twelve years ago, when I moved there. Traffic wasn't very heavy. Today, at eight o'clock in the morning, you've got a problem. Henry County has grown since 1986 when I moved here. 36,000, 37,000 people. So now we're 200,000. So that means every road has had a lot more traffic on it. The people that I went, I didn't think that, I didn't think I had as many people sign. They lined up to sign this paper. We want to sign it. We want something done. And I'm not asking for $150,000 worth of work. I'm asking for an electronic eye to be set up. And it will send a signal to a flashing light. And when a, when a vehicle is detected with that eye, it will cause that light to flash. Yes, there is a possibility of a power outage. But if you put a, if you put a battery pack backup on this system, which will be charged at all times, you won't have any problem. We have a flashing light on the Vida, on the overpass in, in Stockbridge, when the power goes out, it's still flashing. And, it, and all it's doing is telling people, hey, the light is, the light is on, slow down. I'm, I'm asking for maybe five or six thousand dollars. And we're, and, and we're making a big deal out of it. Well, let's take this man's property here. Or let's ask him to give me some property so that I can cut his property down, cut the elevation down. We have a better view. That's too close to eminent domain. Leave my home alone. Like he said about the smoking. I smoked for 51 years from the time I was a little bitty boy. My aunt died and never smoked. Some people do. My wife said me one. And God knows she smokes. She goes outside. She won't smoke in the car. But she smokes. But I'm not going to tell her she can't smoke. I've been with her for seven years. Why should I tell my wife she can't smoke? I endured it for 57 years. I surely can endure it till she's gone. And hopefully that'll be 157. All I'm asking for here is give us a safe safety net. Give us a safety net. So, Someday a bus is going to cross that road and it's going to get hit and somebody's going to get killed all because we don't want to spend a little bit of money. If I had the money, I'd go out there and I'd pay for it. I'd put it in. But then somebody would take it out because I didn't go before somebody gets approval. And I'm not being nasty. I'm not trying to be uh, uh, unreasonable. My last thing here that I said to you folks, in closing, we, we the people in my community, thank all of you citizens, thank all of you for the citizens, realize each of you have to make decisions that will not sit well with citizens of Henry, all citizens of Henry County. We just want tax money, our tax money, and you're talking about it today, our tax money, we want it to be spent where it will render the most good. And I was shocked yesterday. The gentleman told me, he said, did you know we're going to have a tax increase? No. What's new? What's new? I, I'm sorry if I, if, if I feel, if you feel like that I'm out of bounds. But there, I'm 74 years old. 
And we've got people that are older than I am in that subdivision, and they're scared. They're scared to leave the subdivision. They'll go, but they don't like to. And I'm not guaranteeing you that there won't be an accident with, that, with the light put in. I can't, I can't do that. But I can guarantee you one thing. It'll reduce the possibility. Because they said, well, the state, the state man came last year. That's not a state highway. That's a county. So the state ought to stay out of it. But he came. And he said, well, what if that light goes out? They'll just get used to the light being out, and they'll just come on down to the stop sign, and they'll just go on in the highway. Come on. Come on. We've been banning that stop sign now for 38 years. I've been obeying it for 12 years. We're not going to come down to the end of the street and just say, well, it's not blinking, so therefore I can go. We're going to stop. And we're going to look, and then we're going to move. But we'll have a whole lot better chance of getting out in that highway safer than we are right now. I realize it can't be done overnight, but I was told last year, I'll get back with you. Uh -uh. I hadn't seen anybody. They came to my house last year, two people, two, came to my house. Man, they were on fire. You know why? They were running for re-election. And they're not here now. So I'm not, a, I'm not a politician. I'm just a retired Air Force man of, 30, of uh, 20 years. Been retired longer than most of you are old, except a couple, you know. <laughs> you meet me. Thank you very much for giving me this time. Please, please take the time. Please take the time. Uh, Mr. Holmes, would you please take the time to come and visit me? I will take you down and show you exactly what's going on. And the rest of you, sometime get on old Conyers. Come on my street, and I dare you pull out without being scared. Or if you pull out, you'll get scared. I've got a lot of friends. I don't mean anything by this. I've got a lot of friends. I've made a lot of friends of people that pass me. They must have a problem with the right hand. Because they only got one finger. And that's the problem I have with them. They curse me. They curse the people that live there. You can see them. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll pass you. You got two yellow lines. They don't care. You pull out in front of them, you look in the mirror, and they're right on your bumper. Someday we're going to have an accident. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Thank you, Thanks, Mr. Mr. Haney. All right, at this time we're going to move on to county manager comments. Anything for public session? Nobody wants to hear from me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. County Attorney, anything for public session? I, I hesitate to belabor the, the issue, but as the board knows, we don't operate by straw votes and consensus opinions. So on the issue of the directive given to the county manager, Madam Chairman, we need to have, I guess, a motion to the county manager to direct him to do something. And if the motion is that he is to consider all of the health care options that were discussed during this meeting and come up and you direct him to, after making the consultation and review, to come up with a decision and implement that decision, then that should be the motion. But it's not um, appropriate to have a consensus opinion, strong opinion, outside of a form a board meeting where a re resolution is made and directing some action or delegating that authority to the county manager. Because well, otherwise he will be taking action based upon a consensus vote of the board. All right. Well, let me let me ask you this. Do we have need for an executive session today? Yes, ma'am, we do. All right. The, between <laughs> we, when we can go to executive session, we will not discuss that in executive session. I want to make that very clear, but it might give each commissioner an opportunity to process the information, and then when we come back after executive session, um, vote on direction for the county manager at that time. Okay. And, um, and, and that way, it, this is a lot of information, again, and this is a very important decision. I don't want anybody on this board to jump out there and say, 
let's do this or, or whatever without having a chance to process through it. Unless y'all are ready to do it now, we can just wait until we come back. Okay. I thought the, uh, the motion earlier in the meeting, it was the past three to two, approved the insurance plan that was presented. did not carry with it what the employee portion of that premium will be. And the issue that has been discussed yesterday and today, and in addition today, uh, adding the HSA plan is you probably need to come back. And I don't know if that was in the original. Yeah, that wasn't even in there. And it needs to be if, 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 to consider that. the HSA is not an issue because the cost of the HSA to the county at an 80-20 versus the HMO is identical cost. The key to the savings is the increase in the premium to the employees. That's the key. It has nothing to do with premiums. The premiums are what they are. The policy is what it is. The key is how much do you want to charge the employees, same as last year, or an increase to last year to get the type of savings that has been put on the table. Another thought, and this is just a thought, and, and, and obviously we can do anything, but have we thought about surveying employees and asking them had they rather have furlough days or increased insurance premiums you know what i'm saying those are those are issues that that uh, I, I just I, I wonder i don't know it starts the whole ball again well, it's, it, you're starting the whole ball again and, and the whole ball gets started again but again what commissioners have talked about is eliminating the furloughs that exist and to have surveyed them and said would you consider furloughs to take an increase in premium was not something I, I've done based on the fact that the furloughs were suggested to go away so bringing them back after doing away it's just it's all part of the whole process that's all it is I understand, I understand. And, and obviously I haven't shared those same opinions and I just, I just hope you prayed a little harder last night and you got it down to 10 percent. <laughs> I don't think it got above the raft. <laughs> so if it's, if it's amenable to the board, we, come, we'll, we can come back and give direction on that when we finish up shortly <laughs> in executive session. Upcoming meetings and events, Monday, May 14th at 9 a.m. and May 15th at 6.30 p.m. We have regular board meetings. Monday, May 28th, all county offices will be closed in observance of the Memorial Day holiday. And I believe we do have an event going on at Heritage Park that day. So I encourage citizens to um, go to the website and check that out. We typically have um, something out there on Memorial Day. Monday, June the 4th at 9 a.m., Tuesday, June the 5th at 9 a.m. These are both regular meetings. And at this time, I need a motion to convene in the two executive session for the purposes of potential pending litigation, land acquisition, and personnel matters. All right, no one wants to convene in the executive session. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Preston. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Holmes. Question. Yes. How long do you assume that this will last, Madam Attorney? We have only were here yesterday till after 4 o'clock, from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. I hadn't been in my office in a day. How long, how much longer? And I didn't eat yesterday either until 5.30 all day. So I agree with you. Um, Terry and I will be brief. <laughs> that, 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 the question was how long do you, if Terry's going in there, it's not going to be brief. Um, I anticipate uh, about less than 45 minutes. Okay. I have one other. without questions. Okay. Thank you. I have one other question. Terry, today, and, and I'm sorry, but I got a call from, they called me like three times during the meeting today. Uh, they're cutting down the trees on Miller's Mill Road at, right on there the at the church. Yes. All right. I thought we told them all five trees had to come down. They're saying only four of the trees are coming down. All five are on the, are in that six foot span, aren't they? I'm just extending the, our the time. The plans now. call for an improvement in that area, and it's Terry's personal opinion that all of them would need to come down. Um, Georgia DOT may have a different opinion than Terry's interpretation of the plans, so. 
Will you check into that after the meeting for me, we'll, please? We'll continue they're, to check they're into that. They're saying they're only going to cut four down, and it leaves one standing there, actually the big one that's leaning. So, Well, I can't make GDOT do anything. I do think that if if GDOT elects not to do that, we, the county, can look at it and see if that tree is a hazard. Then we should take it down. Okay. That, that, I just wanted to. I'd gotten it, and it, it was like I got the call, and it was like an emergency. So I wanted to. Okay. But anyway. All right. We had a motion by Mr. Preston and a second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor of executive session? All opposed? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be back in 45 minutes. Y'all um, keep an eye on the clock. I need a motion to reconvene into public session. Motion by Mr. Bowman, second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor? Motion carries 4 0. I need a motion for approval of an affidavit and resolution pertaining to executive session. So. Motion by Mr. Holder, second by Mr. Bowman. All in favor? Motion carries 4 0. At this time, we are going to amend the agenda out of public necessity, and we have three items to consider. And, um, Madam County Attorney, do you want to introduce each one of those items? Yes, ma'am. The first item is a resolution um, of the board regarding the transfer of property to the city of McDonough for use as a regional storm warning detention facility. And the resolution will authorize the um, chairman to execute an intergovernmental agreement, agreement concerning the transfer of that property. And that property is known as Big Springs Park, 3.07 acres and to authorize the chairman to sign all documents um, necessary to allow that conveyance. And I have Terry McMichael here who will sort of give just a brief overview of the um, basis for the resolution that is before you. Uh, chairman, <clears throat> chairman and board members, as y'all recall, <clears throat> our SPLOS program built a parking deck in McDonough. After completion of the parking deck, it was agreed upon that we would <clears throat> do our off-site stormwater detention and water quality features. In lieu of doing that, we propose here to uh, convey this 3.07 acres to McDonough. And McDonough has uh, agreed upon receiving that land and in building a like a regional detention pond. Inside of their pond, they would actually take care of our stormwater needs and requirements that we need to do in fulfillment of building that parking deck. So as a part of that, county would deed this property over to them. They would um, incorporate what would have been our detention pond and water quality features into their pond, making it where we wouldn't have to expend that. So we looked at the cost of us going offsite and furnishing or doing our stormwater requirements uh, that cost exceeds uh, what the property there is worth. So we would certainly recommend that we do this exchange, not only that they would incorporate those, but they would, um, since it would be their pond, their property, their thing, they would do the maintenance uh, requirements that were necessary. And also as um, discussed with the county manager that McDonough would be in agreement that once they do that and incorporate that into the pond, that that would mean that um, that would take care of all the needs of there and any responsibilities, liabilities of the county would also become incumbent upon them to uh, to do that as well. And, and just for um, the public consumption, the area that is being um, subject to this transfer will start behind the creek and come, and this is not an exact rep replica of how the property is shaped, but this is from the GIS map. So it will run behind the creek, not the buildings on Veterans Boulevard, but the, the area um, immediately behind it. Um, in addition to the parking deck construction, the county also had during that same span of time the construction of the judicial center. So we have stormwater drainage needs that are occasioned by each of those um, developments. And so this will be assisting 
um, not only the county in maintaining its storm water needs in that area, but it also will be a public benefit to the city of McDonough because the city has its own storm water needs occasioned by development that had nothing to do with the county. And so this really was a win-win situation. The intergovernmental agreement will specify these, these terms. Um, we will put in a reversionary clause such that if the property is, ne is no longer used for this particular purpose, then the property will come back to the county. Um, so we will ask for y'all's um, vote to approve that resolution and motion as I framed it. Mr. Madden. I can make a motion that we approve the transfer and also the, the establishment of an intergovernmental agreement between Henry County and McDonough for this big spring park. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Okay. Okay, and the next item? The second item uh, for consideration deals with property, and I don't have the, I meant to bring the, uh, an aerial map. Well, this is property that is located um, next to North 40 Park in Hampton. And it's where it's 70.55 acres of land that uh, is supposed to be the future location of where the proposed senior center in Hampton will go, hopefully, one day. And uh, just by way of a brief history, um, back in 07, there was a rezoning application that came before the board of some 41 <coughs> acre tract of land uh, next to North 40 Park. And in that rezoning condition, the property owner, Southern Lumber at the time, um, agreed to donate to the county seven and a half acres of land. And that zoning condition, that donation condition, was never fulfilled. The property owner sold it to a new individual. That individual then mortgaged the property. The, the bank that held the mortgage went under, out of business, the FDIC took over the bank and the county began attempting to get the donation condition satisfied by dealing directly with the FDIC. Um, um, when those results um, proved to be futile, the county initiated litigation and since that time um, we have been trying to resolve the issue. I am pleased to say today that the, set, the case has settled and there is a settlement agreement um, that's before you, and it basically involves the county. Um, the only thing that the county will be doing in this particular agreement is allowing the adjacent property that was approved for redevelopment to allow a temporary easement across the property, the right of way along West Main Street, so that a sewer can be connected to the development. Um, that was. Um, the only condition, the property will be released, all the interest in the bank will be released, the county will own the property free and clear, the seven and a half acres will be in the counties. The city of Hampton is also a party to the agreement because the city of Hampton allow, will allow um, the current owner of that property to tap into the sanitary sewer line and they have agreed to reserve um, uh, usage up to a hundred single family homes for ten years. And so I would ask that the board um, approve the settlement agreement as well as the related sewer easement agreement pertaining to this particular lit litigation, um, and that's the property known as next to and adjacent to North 40 Park. And I want to reiterate on this particular agreement that Henry County is not purchasing property. No. This property is being conveyed to Henry County at no cost. Yes, ma'am. No cost. All right, with that being said, there is a settlement agreement before you. And Mr. Preston, this is in your district. I'll definitely make that motion. I have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. And there's one final item. The final item involves the last FOSS II project um, that was completed. And this is property that's located on Patrick Henry Parkway adjacent to that. The county um, acquired the property about three and a half acres of right of way and easement um, and the county has now entered into an agreement with that particular property owner um, for a full and final settlement of those claims. Um, basically the issue was consequential damages. Um, as we discussed briefly yesterday, we deal with those all the time, those such claims all the time in condemnation cases. And so the county 
uh, will resolve that issue and allow a left turn lane under limited conditions into the property as you're coming southbound from Eagles Landing Parkway into the, the subject property. Um, that was one of the major bones of contention. That issue has been resolved um, with the help of our engineers to um, ensure that there are conditions in the agreement that will allow those left turns to be safely maneuvered. So we would ask that the board um, approve the settlement agreement and authorize the chairman to execute the same. Okay. Once more, just for clarification for the public, this is a settlement agreement on property acquisition that was needed for Patrick Henry Parkway. It goes back several years. That is a SPLOS 2 project, and uh, the money for this is coming from SPLOS 2 funds. Yes. Yes. Right, Mr. County, Bowman? Well, and just to say, just the money, uh, because I, just so that the public will know what that money is, it's just $50,000. The demand was $1.5 million. <laughs> so um, we have um, been working on this case, and um, this is a good result. Mr. Bowman, this lies in your district. I'll look to you for a motion. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the settlement offer. I feel like it's a very fair settlement offer, and that. Uh, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> congratulate the staff on all the hard work they've done, Terry and uh, LaTanya and others that have done on this particular project because it is a SPLOS 2, which goes back several years, and uh, there was a lot of contention early on on this particular project, uh, and I appreciate the hard work you guys have done in order to make that happen. And In doing so, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the settlement offer. And we have a motion by Mr. Bowman. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Holder. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Now at this time, uh, before we went into executive session, um, we had the discussion pertaining to the cost for employee health insurance coverage and what that needed to look like in the upcoming budget. Um, after hearing from several commissioners on this, um, the last uh, impression that I had is that Everybody wants to leave the rates as they are. Well, <laughs> is there any other um, consideration you would like to float before your fellow employees, uh, fellow employees, your fellow commissioners pertaining to the employee health coverage cost? Okay, if not, then I guess we need a motion to direct the county manager to go with the costs that were presented to the board on the sp spreadsheet yesterday. It, 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 oh, you got to have a motion to do it, or is it just a consensus? Just a, a consensus from the board or a motion? with my fellow commissioner. I, I can't do that. You, you can't, Lars, you can't. I can't. You can ask her a question. Right, guys. No, no. No, so, yeah. <laughs> so moved that he can whisper and hold her ear. <laughs> <or something. laughs> yeah. Let them talk. Let them talk. They're going to try to get us in trouble. Just whisper. No, I really wasn't going to. I mean, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out what... I'm trying to figure out exactly what we're talking about. That's all. I'm just the races. The rates. The races. Which this is really a first the first time we've ever even had this consider right. had this come before the board for consideration. Right. Typically the county manager presents the numbers from the finance department and HR and we've never had the discussion before. I don't know why we're really having it this time, to be honest with you, but... Well, I call it heartburn. That's what. Well, I think when we looked at in the past, the previous agreements never came before the board, but they should have come before the board. And the contracts on our health insurance. And so we're trying to correct that issue and that problem. The comments that I made, Chairman, before executive session, dealt with, I heard that there was some directives being given to the county manager, but he was supposed to come back and take official action on behalf of this board after gaining a consensus, and we can't do consensus votes. So I was just clarifying that if you were going to give a directive to the county manager, it had to be in the form of a motion that the board gave, either delegate him the authority to make this decision, and after looking at all the evidence and the numbers, or y'all tell him exactly what it is you all want him to do. But he could not go on a consensus vote, taking straw poll votes outside of a public setting 
to initiate official action. I, I, and that part I understand. And we gave direction on signing the contract with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I guess my question comes in in the fact that now we're determining how much our employees will pay for their coverage and how much the county will pay for their coverage. This is the first year we have ever undertaken that. We typically take recommendations from our staff on what that split should be. We've never taken an official That's vote right. on that cost, just like we don't take an official vote on setting salaries. We don't. Those are things we don't typically do. That's day-to-day -day operations yep. and management of the county. So. And you're right. And I thought perhaps there was some issue about the health HSAs or the health insurance and whether or not y'all, you know, we're going to enter into those different arrangements. And I did not hear. The only thing I heard, Madam Chair, was um, get a strong vote or call and then you can take your action based upon that. So if the directive is for the county manager to make that decision based upon looking at all the numbers and the figures and using his best judgment, then that's fine. I think that's in the normal course of what the Madam, county manager has done in the past. Madam Chair. Uh, again, uh, the only reason this has been brought to you is the fact that one commissioner, uh, rightfully so, said, I have found a way to save $2.3 million, $3 million, whatever the figure is. It's obviously very big. Uh, I don't think I, as the county manager, should ignore a request of a county commissioner nor should I not allow the other commissioners to understand what that proposal is and how to save what, what one's feeling is to be 2.3 or $3 million. Um, the employees of this county or citizens of this county, um, they're, they're your employees, my employees, just the same. Uh, I'm here to put forth what was presented and give you the calculations and to the extent you want, as was discussed in the prior session, to save or find $2.3 million to reduce the $10 million, that is what would have to be done. So um, we're back to the discussion on HSA. Whether we no, it's not, H, it's, it's not just HSA. It's the total increases by each particular policy that comes to the 2.3. The HSA, as I showed, is not going to be any different than an employee okay. Paying the same thing, it's the it's the jump from fifty one dollars to one hundred and twenty five dollars, or one hundred and forty to three hundred and fifty dollars, is where the money and savings is coming from. All right, that and the spousal surcharge and the smoking surcharge. So I guess the question is, do we have to make a motion to say we are not interested in tobacco surcharges, and then a motion to say we're not interested in spousal surcharges, and then a motion to say we concur with the county manager's assessment on the premiums charged to the employees. Yes. And it can all be one motion. Anyone care to make a motion? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm ready. I move to approve the the numbers as to, or, or the proposal as presented by the county manager, and to remove the spousal and tobacco uh, surcharge. What do you call it? Surcharge. Surcharge. And no consideration for HSA. No. The the HSA can be added up if we're. Because it's just a matter of accepting uh, Commissioner Preston's rates, you know, split, that's okay. Yeah, again, the HSA is to not make it this, optional, to make it, it can optional. be optional, okay. but the only thing you'll have to do, I think, and I defer to the county attorney, is this morning you uh, approved a resolution. Uh, if you would amend this morning's resolution to also accept the HSA proposal from. Blue Cross Blue Shield. I have no with it, and I don't think Brian does either. I think he, he understands even that, you know. The only thing I will add, though, is if you, there's no reason to add the HSA option if you're not going to change the existing rate structure because it, there's no incentive other than the tax deduction to do it because you don't, the other premiums don't adjust. So that's not, I mean. Okay, we'll just leave it. I don't know if you want to add that because it's not going to be an effective thing. You're just going to create more work for your Blue Cross officials is all that's going to do. They have to work in conjunction with each but, other. Yeah, just leave it out because, again, I still say that if, with the HSA, you, you're looking at a shift. Uh, the only thing I will add is that 
say is next year maybe is if nobody signs up for the POS plan this year or we have very limited that we do give consideration in the future for, for some of those things. But Fred's been very, Mr. Ola has been very, we've shared those thoughts. So I, I think that probably goes without saying. The, the key is, uh, and the HSA is, is, was mentioned earlier, it's an educational thing. Um, and to the extent you're, you're putting a program that nobody understands and can't digest, dissimilar to you to digest the three, four, the three plans that are there and how to split them, whatever, for an employee, they know that they're going to have to figure out what to do if you add another plan. So adding the HSA is not the issue. As Commissioner Preston said, if you don't adjust the rates higher, there's no incentive for anybody to do because of the out-of-pocket deductibles. It won't go anywhere. Nobody will sign up for it. All right. We have a motion on the floor from Mr. Holder to approve county manager's rec recommendation, remove spousal surcharges and tobacco surcharges. Is there a second to that? Second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor of the motion? All opposed. Okay, motion carries 3-1 with Holmes, Holder, and Bowman in favor and Commissioner Preston in opposition. If there's no further business to come before the board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Bowman, second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. We stand adjourned.